The next case is uh, Nicholas Pike. That's the exact same voice. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're all present, so we can go on the record. Good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record before the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians to review the petition for reinstatement by Nicholas Pike. This is OAH case number 2019-101013. My name is Tiffany King, and I am the Administrative Law Judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings who is assigned to preside <coughs> over this matter. Prior to going on the record, the board did identify themselves, and uh, we do have a quorum of the board present. If I can please have the appearance of counsel for the record, <laughs> Mr. Steinheimer. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor and board members. Uh, Andrew Steinheimer, Deputy Attorney General. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522 and Business and Professions Code Section 2878.7, representing the people of the state of California. And Mr. Pike, I will note for the record that you're present and representing yourself today. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And were you previously advised you could have hired an attorney to represent you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Pike, you were present when I met with the petitioners this morning to go over today's process, correct? Correct. Do you have any questions regarding this process before we begin? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mr. Steinheimer? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to have marked for identification uh, Exhibit 1, which is the uh, petition packet and accompanying documents. A copy has been provided to the board members as well as to the petitioner. Uh, exhibit 1 consists of the petition for reinstatement, which is uh, found at pages A1 through A11. Exhibit 1 also consists of a license certification for the petitioner found at page B1. It contains a notice of hearing and related correspondence, um, which are found at pages C1 through C7 as well as a July 1st, 2018 letter from the petitioner, which is at C8. And then finally, uh, the decision and order from the BVN PT case number VN 2013-2582, uh, which was effective August 6, 2015. I'd like to have Exhibit 1 admitted into evidence at this time. Mr. Pike, do you have any objection? No. Exhibit 1's admitted? Uh, thank you. Now I'd like to provide a brief history of um, the petitioner's uh, license history with the, with the board. Petitioner's vocational nurse license number is VN254426. The license was first issued on December 1st, 2010. An accusation was filed before the board and against petitioner on April 9, 2015. The accusation was based on a criminal conviction on July 14th, 2014 for driving under the influence and the dangerous use of alcohol. As matters in aggravation, there was also a number of prior uh, convictions uh, listed. Mm -hmm. Petitioner agreed to a stipulated surrender of his license and that uh, stipulation was adopted by the board effective August 6, 2015. The stipulated surrender included an agreement to pay costs in the amount of $1,715. This balance remains outstanding. Petitioner is now requesting that the board reinstate his license. Thank you. Mr. Pike, I believe you had some documents you wanted to provide the board yes, before we begin. If you could bring those up here and make sure Mr. Steinheimer gets a copy. Give this copy. Okay. <clears throat> So they, they're separated by yeah, these. So each, Wonderful. Yeah. I didn't count those out, so tell me if I didn't give you enough. Okay. Thank you. And so, Mr. Pike, these are these are transcript records from San Diego State University? Oh, from Western Governors University Online? Yes, ma'am. First, the unofficial one is the Western. WGU, yes. And then the last page there for SDSU is the uh, court-ordered program that I completed from the 2013 conviction. Okay. So I'm going to mark the, the, the transcript, which is three pages. That'll be Exhibit 2. And then the CSU San Diego um, regarding your, your program completion will be marked as Exhibit 3. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Okay, um, Mr. Pike, it's been noted that your address is listed on your transcript as well as your driver's license and your birth date on Exhibit 3. If there's no objection, we will be redacting um, that personal information so it's not part of the public record. Absolutely, that's fine. Okay. Mr. Steinheimer, have you had a chance to review Exhibits 2 and 3? I have, and I have no objection. Then therefore, two, Exhibits 2 and 3 are admitted. Mr. Pike, whenever you're ready, you can make your statement to the board. All right. Uh, I want to just... Excuse me, Your Honor. I think um, I don't believe you sworn Mr. Pike in yet. So thank you. I, I did forget that. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state, under penalty of perjury, that the evidence you will give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And now you may Your Honor, if I may, very quickly, uh, may we have a protective order with respect to the redactions because the the um, documents have been distributed to the majority of the board members. Uh, otherwise making it a public record for purposes of Public Record Act. If we have a protective order in that regard, then only the redacted version would be subject to a, a disclosure on the Public Records Act. I will issue that order if there's no objection. No objection. No objection. And then our, a written order will come from our office tomorrow. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. To the board, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Let me start with saying I have been waiting for, the, um, for five long years uh, for this day. My challenge has been uh, acceptance and positive change. Today I have met those challenges. Since losing my OVN license, a lot has changed professionally and personally. I have dedicated my life to uh, my sobriety, family, and fitness. I have a wonderful, loving wife and a supportive wife with two of the most amazing children. <clears throat> Ella, who is 10, and Jax, who is 2, soon to be 3. My motivation is simple, and it's to lead by example. So how have I done that? Well, the first step was to stop drinking. I remember it was September 2016 when I found out my wife was pregnant with my son. I was in shock, but more so, it finally hit me. Okay, sorry about that. Yep. Do you need him to be closer to the mic as well? Or? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> so I found out my wife was pregnant with my son. I was in shock, but more so, it finally hit me. I had to wake up and grow up and put my family first. Then my energy was, how can I better myself to help me and those I love around me? So I enrolled back into college uh, part-time. So Mr. Pike, I'm, uh, since you're reading from a document, sometimes it helps if after every sentence you take a brief pause before you go into your next sentence. It will feel like a very long pause to you. It won't feel like a long pause to the rest of us. I apologize. That's Sorry, I'm just a little nervous. Okay. Uh, so I enrolled back into college part-time through the VA educational program at WGU Online. I am still enrolled and currently full-time. I have been a stay-at-home dad since 2014, raising my 10-year-old and 2-year-old, while also supporting my wife's career as a RN, who is now the DON of her facility. During this period, not only have I got into great shape, but I have learned to treat myself well and accept who I am. Life has been a blessing. I'm focused and I'm ready to help others if I'm allowed. I can't wait to give back to society in a positive manner. I wanna show my kids their dad is a leader. Again, thank you for hearing my story and I hope you feel confident in me. Thank you, Mr. Pike. We're now entertaining questions from the board. Dr. Mountain. Good afternoon. Over here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your story with us sure. and your sobriety. Can you tell me what type of um, support system you have in place um, as you look at regaining your license and possibly going back to being your VN, correct? Yes, ma'am. Support has always been there. I just chose to kind of ignore it, I guess. Um, Mr. Pike, I am going to ask you to speak more into the microphone again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the support has always been there. Um, it's still there. Uh, I, I just chose at the time to, uh, I guess, try to handle things without, you know, uh, using my support systems. Um, that was my weak, my weakness there. Um, 
But basically, uh, with everything that I got now, uh, you know, with my children and my wife, that's all the support I need. Me taking care of myself. Um, we're all in the medical field. My my mother, my my wife, um, everybody, all our all our friends, everybody I know. Um, I have uh, friends who are uh, counselors as well. Um, I have a lot of friends um, that have been through similar experiences that I have with uh, a drinking problem. So I, I've reached out to a lot of them. Um, I get about 100% though lately of my support right from my household, right from my immediate family and my in-laws. Um, my father's passed away in 2013, and uh, he was he was my everything. Um, so now I, I gotta I wanna I wanna you know do that for my kids. I wanna be their everything. Do you attend AA? I don't. You don't. No. Nope. Um, so you don't feel like you need that kind of support system. No, ma'am, I don't. Um, I, I, I went to, uh, if you'll notice on the uh, information I gave, when I got sentenced by the court to do the DUI program, which involves AA meetings and uh, volunteer time, it was a struggle for me. It took me, <laughs> took me four years to do an 18-month program because, because I was not ready to accept the fact that I had a problem and I wasn't ready to stop drinking. Um, I thought I could do it, and I thought I could get away with it and manage myself, and, and I thought I was being a man by trying to do all of that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, my behavior changed, but it, it, the only behavior that didn't change was the drinking. It was still there as of 2013. Um, I continued to drink a little bit after 2013, obviously, until you know I, had lo I lost my father. I, I drank a little bit. I got that DUI. That was the actual weekend that everything happened when I got the DUI. Lost my father. I went out and just said, you know, screw everything, I'm gonna just do what I wanna do, and I was very selfish with it, and I, and I messed up. And, uh, I, and I knew better from previous experience. All through the 90s, I had issues with, with alcohol, and, uh, and everything in my life that's ever been negative has been because of alcohol. And um, like we've heard today from other people, I'm either all in or all out, um, and I have a very strong, hard-headed personality, so if I make a choice to do something, I do it. And I made that choice the day that my wife called me to tell me she was pregnant, that I was done. And uh, ever since then, I haven't looked back. Do I get craving sometimes? Do I think about drinking? Yeah, here and there. Is it a big deal anymore? No, not anymore. When it first happened, yeah, it was a big deal. I, had to, I, I lost all my friends. I lost everybody that I hung out with. I couldn't be around people. Sorry. Uh, I couldn't be around folks. Um, I just wasn't ready. Um, I could sit here today and tell you I'm ready. I'm ready to be back into society no matter what the situation is. Um, and I keep using that word back into society is because I feel like I've been on the sidelines for so long. Sorry. <laughs> I feel like I've been on the sidelines for so long. Um, but I have been doing good things with my time. I have been raising my children. I've put myself back into school. Even before the VA paid for me, I paid for my own way to go back into school. Um, I've always had a plan and a plan after that plan. Um, so. I'm going to school right now for business administration, and the reason why I chose that was because if I find out that I'm not allowed to go back into the medical field, that was my next option. So if you were to get your license back, um, I have two, two questions. One is, what have you been doing to stay current? How comfortable would you be with that? And what type of nursing would you be looking at should you return to the medical field? Two good questions. Yeah, first of all, medical field's always around me. My wife's an RN. I'm constantly hearing it all. She works 20 Mr. hours. Mr. Pike, I just... Down a lot. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. I keep forgetting. Yes. Take it. Just take a deep breath. All right. Sorry. Uh, kind of recenter. Yeah, so basically, uh, I'm ready to go back. I, I, hear, I hear my wife's working every day. Uh, medical jargon, this and that. It's, it's constantly around me. Um, you know, as far as in the house, in the household. I'm sorry, I lost focus on the question. I'm ready to get back into the medical field. Um, that, that's my passion. That's what I want to do. That's what makes me a sense of work. Have you done anything to stay current besides listen to your wife? Have you <laughs> taken any classes? Uh, I, I have not. I've done some C, uh, CEUs. Um, yes, I have done those. Other than that, um, if, you know, a new drug comes out on the market, I'll look, you know, read about it online or something like that. But, uh, no, I haven't taken any refresher courses or anything like that, but I'd be willing to. And, and what type of nursing did you do before when you had your license, and what are you thinking about when you return? Okay, so uh, when I had my license, I actually got lucky and uh, started my own business, residential care. Um, and how I fell into that was when I was a student, I was doing home care for a gentleman 
and uh, he had a uh, fiduciary who was in charge of his his uh, his house or whatever. So um, what happened was that fiduciary liked the way I worked. He knew I was in school. Once I graduated, he he told me he had worked for me, and basically um, I had five different households, five different residents, and I I ran everything from them for them from medication to doctor's appointments to staff in their house with CNAs and caregivers and such. And I did that for um, from, what, 20, 2013 to, or actually from 2010 I started, but I didn't practice my living license until I got it. And then I, I started doing that from 2013 to like 2014. And I, I gave it up when I gave up my license. Once I had to surrender, I just, I stopped everything. So obviously I wasn't allowed to work in my field anymore. So, so what, are, what type of nursing are you considering when you go back, or have you thought about it? I have thought about it. I've thought about it every day. Um, I'm thinking about going into a skilled nursing facility. Um, my wife works for Windsor, and um, I've, I've been presented with some opportunities there if I, if I do, in fact, get my license back. Okay. Thank you. I have no other questions. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. Turner? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Peck. Good afternoon. What is your sobriety date? September 27th, 2016, I was at a football game when I got the phone call, and I was drinking beer that day. <laughs> and uh, when she told me, I, I, that was it. It was my last day. Right. I haven't, haven't touched a drop since. All right. And according to your petition that you filed, you haven't been working for the past seven years? Correct. How do I you haven't support been yourself? So I get a VA disability, and I also get paid to go to school by the VA. So that's been my supplemental income. My wife makes fantastic money now, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I've been blessed with her to go ahead and help out on the other end of that. And um, I also take up odd end jobs here and there. Um, this summer, I put patio furniture together all summer for people around my neighborhood, two, three hundred dollars a shot. So uh, I, I'm I'm pretty pretty crafty at you know putting myself to work when when needed. Okay. And you mentioned something about um, working in residential care. Is that was that before or after? I mean, so that was, was that? before all of this. That, I just sort of fell into that. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in the Army, I was a medic, and I worked in the hospital. I worked with pediatrics. I also worked in the newborn nursery. Um, so I do like working with kids. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just sort of fell into that with the uh, residential care and the geriatric care, mm -hmm. and, and I liked it. Right. So what was your rank in the Army? I was an E-4 specialist. Okay. How long were you in the Army? Three years, 22 weeks. Where? I was in uh, Fort Wayne, right, Alaska, at the Bassett Army Community Hospital. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Carpenter? Yes, Dr. Mountain asked most of the questions that I had. Thank you. <laughs> um, you state that you were involved in a MAAC project at San Diego State University. Can you uh, yes, explain that to me? Yeah, that was a court ordered project. Um, by the court. And, what does it uh, stand for, the MAAC? It's an acronym for MAC. Um, I don't, I have no idea. It's their, it's their, their, uh, they're a uh, nonprofit organization, I guess, that gives back to the community. And apparently they're contracted with the court system to run these DUI programs. And that, that's pretty much all I know about them. And what did you gain from going through that program? <laughs> uh, well, um, <clears throat> I gained a lot of tools on how to reach out, basically, if, if I can't handle my sobriety anymore. I, I, know, I know that um, there's tools out there now besides my family. There's people that I could talk to outside of my family. And for the longest, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, going there and hearing other people's stories and going to these classes every day or every week for all those months um, was an eye-opener eye every time I had to go. It just it was just, uh, I just felt ignorant that I was there because I made such a bad choice. And um, basically what I got out of it is I never want to do that again. Um, you know, I need to control my, my, my choices and, and, and do the right thing. There's an outstanding balance still from your investigation. Are you prepared to pay that off? I'm not prepared to pay that today, but I will pay that. I'm on a fixed income. All my money that I get goes to the wife. Um, and yes, I, uh, I'll definitely pay that. I don't have a problem paying that if I have to. Okay, thank you. Mr. Maxey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Pike. Um, question, um, you said the most important reason why you are sub 
you've been sober is because of the birth of your child or the, the finding out of your, your, your son, correct? Most important reason is me, but in addition to that, what put me over the edge was finding out that my wife was pregnant with my son, yes. Thank you. Um, how much has being a stay-at-home father changed your life and what have you learned from the, that experience? I've learned a great deal of patience, first of all, <laughs> with two children. Um, it's changed my life because it's given me time to uh, reflect on all my bad decisions. It gave me time to realize I actually wrote a journal of everything that's negative that's happened in my life and what was the underlying factor to that and everything was alcohol. Um, so knowing that, you know, and looking back on all this time at home, it was motivating to know and it was, it was, it was uh, satisfying to know that I figured this out. But at the same time, I learned that um, I do want to get back to full-time work. I do want to, you know, I, I, I enjoy my time with my children. It has been a blessing, and uh, it still is. And, and not too many fathers have that opportunity to stay at home and, and, and do this. But um, it's time. It's time for me to move on and help my wife provide. And I know you have not taken AA, but would you be willing, if in fact we required it as a board, sure, to, to submit yourself to AA and take the courses weekly, monthly, however? Yes, sir. Whatever, whatever the board, re you know, would recommend, I, I, I would be all for it. And just curious, I know you said it already, but why did you not think it was important to do, uh, to join AA? I mean, just to maybe put it on the record before you came across this board to say, hey, you know what, here's, here's something that I'm submitting to you to say. So I, I, I don't say AA is, it's not, I didn't say AA is not important. It, it's important for a lot of folks, and a lot of folks need AA. I just never got that involved into it. I was there on a court order, and there was some serious stuff going on in those meetings. And um, those people that were talking about that serious stuff, you know, very confidential, very tight group of people there. So... It was almost like a inner circle within the circle. So us court order guys that were there, sure, we were there, we were partaking, but that wasn't our lives, I guess. So um, that's why I never really got into the whole AA steps and all that. What I was doing was working for me at the time, and it still is. Um, so I just never, never turned that direction. What's your drink of choice when you're watching football? Soda, Coke. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Is it? Okay. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. Ms. Endozo. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for taking my question. <laughs> but thank you for your service, and yes, I have no questions right now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Baste Martinez. Good afternoon. Yes, Good afternoon. Um, I still need a little help understanding, and it's, it, just, it probably doesn't work for everyone, but Okay. your concerns about uh, AA. I'm, I'm lost a little bit. Huh. You say it just doesn't work for me. No, no. What would it look like if it were working for you? Um, I don't. I, I didn't say it doesn't work for me. Um, I, I just never made made that choice to work the steps. I, I was what was working for me was working, and that was just showing up to the meetings, going to the AAs, and um, just just networking with the folks that were around me, um, and then just my general support at home. And me going to the gym and just me doing me is what was working. So um, I, I didn't. I don't have a problem again with people doing AA or going through the steps or working. I just just haven't done that, and I've been successful up to this point. I haven't gotten any trouble. I haven't drank. I should say I've been successful since that DUI, as far as not getting in any more trouble with alcohol or drinking, or, or maybe <laughs> having challenges. I, you know, we all have challenges, and and sometimes I'm not. You know, again. I have woke up or I have walked past a bar and smelt liquor and I'm like, wow. But at the same time, I'm, it's a quick second and, I, and I, I refocus. And it's not even a refocus. It's just, it's, it's really nothing to me anymore. It's taken years to get to this point. And unless, you're, you know, unless you've done it, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's like, it's like a mental workout. You know, you strengthen your mind, you strengthen your mind, and pretty soon it just gets easier and easier. Okay. You shared with us that you have been journaling and you discovered all of the things that you wished wouldn't have happened were affected by alcohol. In doing that journaling, have you identified what 
uh, frequently is called triggers, things that send you sent you off the edge yes, ma'am. that made you want to drink. And what are those? Depression and anger. So how are you now with aggression and anger? Uh, depression and anger. Oh, depression. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I thought, <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, I handle it well. I go to the gym. So um, depression is, uh, is not as bad as it used to be. Um, I think I was more depressed that I lost everything because of the drinking is what was on my mind. But um, prior to that, um, depression was just uh, me not me not meeting up to my self expectations prior to all this. I had these grandiose plans of what I was going to do with my life, and things weren't working out. Um, so I started picking up the bottle, um, get angry, have a bad day or whatever. I'd go, you know, I thought the right thing, you know, go, I'm going to go drink it off. Well. <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't a good idea. Um, now, if I have a bad day, I, I go to the gym six times a week. Um, so if I have a bad day, I can't wait to get to the gym and just take it out all over those weights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Amazola? <clears throat> I have no questions at this time. Thank you for your service. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Mr. Durking? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Pike? Yes, sir. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, you referenced the most recent DUI in 2015? 2013. 2013, right. the last right. one I've ever got, yes. But you've had a number of DUIs over, that, a, yes. over a rather long period of time. Correct, over 12 recall, years. Do you recall when your first DUI was? <sighs> yes, I believe it was in 1995. So how many DUIs? Three. Pardon me? I've had three DUIs. Three. Yes, sir. The third one being 2013. Okay, and you did indicate that you have had exposure to AA, correct? Exposure to AA when? You, you went to AA meetings. After the 2013 incident, correct. You indicated in your, your petition that you've gone to a couple hundred meetings. Right. Over 18 months, yeah, it took me four years. It turned out to be way more than the actual meetings. And that's so because it was court ordered. Yes, sir. So your approach to dealing with the underlying problem of alcohol is abstinence. Abstinence. Do you think there's a difference between abstinence and sobriety? And if so, what? I think the difference is sobriety and abstinence is, is um, abstinence, you had a problem. I know I'm an alcoholic. And that's why I choose to abstain from it and not do it. Um, so that's how, you know, as far as the difference between that and sobriety, I don't, I, you know, I'd imagine this, the difference would be somebody who's sober all the time has not had to deal with this. I, I, I'm not sure what we're... So would you consider yourself to be engaged, uh, actively engaged in a recovery? Uh... I don't want to say I'm actively engaged 100%. I think, um, am I in recovery still? Uh, I'd like to think I'm on the outskirts of recovery, but I do know that I always have that problem, you know, deep down and that I need to be aware of it and I need to be conscious of it and I, and I know how to handle it. And as soon as I don't feel I have a grip on that, I'll reach out. But it's been six years. Uh, well, seven years, 2013, or uh, since, you know, I mean, it's been a while. So uh, it's been four years, basically. And it'll be, uh, it's actually going to be four years here coming up September. So you're saying that if you find yourself in a previous state or situation where you were inclined to drink, you would reach out? I've been, I, yes, I would. And I have been. Mr. Pike, I, I do need you to t speak into the microphone, please. Uh, yeah, so if, if, if I find, and I have found myself in situations where, you know, have been triggers in the past, and, I, and, I've, and I've dealt with those appropriately and successfully, yes. Okay, who do you reach out to? To my wife, to my mother, to my in-laws, or um, I just go to the gym or, or handle it internally. And the reason I'm um, asking these questions is that page A7 of the uh, petition you indicated that AA has helped. It did. And the reason why I say AA has helped because I heard so many people's other stories and I realized that, hey, these people have gotten up from way worse things than I have. 
you know, I, I have no excuse. I, I got tired of making excuses for myself. So what do you think the value of AA or other 12-step programs is? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great value. I think it was a good, I got the best I could out of it for me, I felt, and I think it's, it's good for anybody who wants to use it. I don't dislike it. I don't have any problems with AA. I, I, again, it's, it's a program that's in place, and I, I know tons of people have worked the system. So you understand uh, one of the values of AA is accountability, a community who knows the games and manipulations that uh, you may have been engaged in? Again, I, I'm, I'm just telling you what I know. I don't know much about the AA steps. Um, I know I went to my meetings. I know I shared. Okay. And I know I've been positive, and I know I've kept myself out of trouble, and I know I, I haven't drank. Okay, I, I'm talking about the value of the community rather than working the steps, which okay. is ancillary. Yeah, the value of the community? Yes, I, I, the value of the community would be, would be me not getting in trouble, me not wasting taxpayers' dollars, me doing the right thing, me being a positive influence in the community, me going to work every day, contributing. Okay, I'm talking about the value of the AA community. <clears throat> what about it? Do you understand that there's why it's considered a valuable resource for people in recovery? Sure, I do. I've seen them use it. Yes, sir. Okay, you, you indicated, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the triggers in your life for using alcohol over a, a lengthy period of time were depression and anger. Yes, sir. How are you addressing those? Because at page A7, you indicate you're not uh, involved in any kind of therapeutic... Mm -hmm. uh, emotional or uh, psychiatric regimen. Yes. Again, I'm addressing those with my family support, my children, and going to the gym, keeping my time focused on positive things, whether it be school, um, activities with the children, um, church, family vacations. There's just so much in life now that I could do that I do um, that has nothing to do with alcohol or, or for any reason want to do with alcohol. Not a part of my life anymore. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your sure. Honor. Mr. Sellers? Um, just thank you for your service. I have no questions. Sure. Ms. Norton? Um, I'll echo thank you for your service. I was a spec five nice. in the Army. Okay. So, um, you had a long history of sort of reckless behavior, um, and you have dealt with it. Um, repeating back your own words, I believe, that you think you have a firm grip on handling it because you have a support system at home, you have your, you have your wife, you have your in-laws, you're around the medical field all the time, you go to the gym and you work out. Yeah. Um, what happens if something happens to that support system? I need to step up and be there for the rest of that system. I need to be present and sober clean clean minded focused what if that support system walks away from you well i don't see that happening but if it did then i i would have to deal with that in a positive manner how would you deal with that well i haven't thought about that because i don't think that's going to happen but uh, i i don't know I, I i definitely wouldn't drink if that's what you're asking i definitely would not yeah i, and think I can sit here and tell you that yeah i think that's what i am asking because i think part of the benefit of going to a program a rehab program continuing to go to aa is that when you have a long history such as yourself um nobody prepares for these things that's how we get caught up in them right we have to prepare for the for the you know for for the unknown yes, um it does seem like it, looking at you it seems like you have a very firm grasp right now on what is what is on in your life right um Going back to work, um, you'll come into stressors there. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Different stressors. Different stressors. Okay. And you believe you'll be able to withstand those? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were ordered to a court-ordered anger management, correct? Yes, ma'am. What, what, what was the cause for that? Uh, it was related with the drinking. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the charges with the DUI was um, anger management to go along with the DUI program. Uh, I, I think I, during the arrest, I was just, uh, my behavior was out of control, and I was okay. violent. You mentioned? Uh, violent. Uh, yeah. 
So, Mr. Pike, again, if you could speak into the microphone. Okay. Sorry, you don't have to look at me. I know it's really okay, awkward. Okay, no worries. Yeah, you look, look wherever you need to look. Yes, ma'am. Um, again, we're going back to your wife, okay. right, and the anger management and the violence. Yes, ma'am. So you were convicted of domestic battery. Yes, ma'am. Is that against your current wife? Yes. It is. Okay. Um, what have you? What did you learn in anger management? Because now it seems like you're you're placing your sobriety on your wife, who you committed domestic violence against. And so I need to know mm -hmm. what changed there. Well, a couple of things here. First of all, um, I see the direction you're putting this. Um, I'm not putting my sobriety on my wife. I'm putting my sobriety on myself. That's that's number one. Number two, um, what happened that day when I came home drunk? Um, I broke into my own house, is where the domestic violence came in, and I shattered my 200-gallon fish tank, and I just started punching things in the house. I came home angry and drunk, and I, and I uh, got arrested for it. Um, they asked my wife, you know, what she wants to do, and she said, keep him in there. He needs it, and uh, that's what they did. I did some time for that, uh, six months in the county uh, facility, got out, and uh, my wife was right there for me. And I, I didn't know if she was going to be there, to be honest with you. And uh, when she was there, I decided at that point that, you know, I need to prove my love back to her, basically. And um, I do that. I try to do that every day. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't have any other, other questions. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Steinheimer. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, most of the questions I had intended to ask have been asked by the board, but um, I just want to, um, one thing with respect to the domestic violence conviction, um, in the original accusation, it indicates that um, you ultimately were successful in having that reduced and then dismissed uh, under Penal Code 1203.4, is that correct? Yes, sir, I got everything expunged. Okay, and then, um, with respect to the restatement of your uh, license, if the board is going to do that, um, it's most likely that they would also require you to be on probation for some period of time. Okay. Um, and because your um, history involves the abuse of alcohol, um, it's likely that there would be terms of your probation, including abstaining from alcohol, submitting to alcohol testing, and participating in a 12-step program such as AA. And you've talked a bit about uh, you know, AA and how you feel about it, but would you be willing to participate in a 12-step program um, if it was required as a term of your probation? Absolutely. Okay, and do you think that you could um, like commit to it in terms of uh, trying to seek the um, the benefit from it as opposed to just going through the steps to comply with probation. Oh, yes. If I'm going to commit to something, I want to be all in for it. So absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then just to confirm, there was some talk about, um, you threw out a bunch of dates about seven years from this and four years from this. Your sobriety date or the last date that you had a drink of alcohol is uh, September 27, 2016? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. And so when you're talking about like seven years, that was from the last your DUI or the conviction? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Here. Okay, our, our uh, panel, the board, one more time. Dr. Mountain, any further questions? I have no further questions. Ms. Turner? Yes, I was going to ask about the three DUIs and why you entered into the stipulation um, rather than to come before the board and try to um, resolve it. Um, I didn't. That's a fantastic question. That there uh, was a domestic <laughs> yes, issue as well. But uh, I, I decided to surrender my license. Uh, I didn't argue with it because I knew I needed to help myself before I could help anybody else. There was no way I was going to be able to go to work in that, that state of mind and, and try to help somebody else. It just wasn't going to happen. That's it. Ms. Carpenter? Yes, you mentioned... Um, depression issues. Um, what sort of triggers um, led to bouts of depression? Another good question. Uh, I was in the military. I was getting ready to uh, move on to my next duty station, which was going to be an airborne unit in Georgia. 
And I had took a physical and found out that uh, my lungs were scarred from a chemical accident we had during training in the military. Um, I've since had four nose surgeries. Um, I carry an inhaler so I could breathe. Um, it, it really hurt me that I couldn't go to airborne school. My, my whole dream was either to be a football player or to be airborne. And uh, when I couldn't, you know, when I couldn't do that, it, was, it, it, it hurt me. And that's, that, that was the start of it. Yes, ma'am. So how did you deal with that disappointment at that time? Well, when all that happened at that time, that disappointment, um, I, you know, especially when I found out I couldn't go, and then I, I had basically gave up my military career. I decided to ETS out, and they actually med medically discharged me. And I was more in shock than anything. I just went through the motions. Um, things didn't really hit home for maybe a couple years after that I was living as a civilian back home and not doing doing the things I wanted to do in life. And that's when it really dawned on me how much I lost. And, and I felt things were unfair because I, you know, I was a healthy guy when I got into a training accident. And, and it, 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 you know, it uh, kept me from doing what I wanted to do in life. But um, I, I realized also that I couldn't just sit there and feel sorry for myself either. You know, I wasn't going to get anything accomplished anymore in life if I just kept crying about that. But it did. It took me a couple years to, to kind of get over that. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Maxey? You know, depression and anger are common challenges that all of us face. Yes, sir. Um, and I think um, sometimes they come without you even knowing that they're going to come. Um, who do you work with to manage these challenges? Um, are there self-help books that you've read that you could attest to? Are, are there TV shows that you watch? <laughs> um, something to give us to say, hey, you know what? It's not just an internal and, and going to the gym because you know we all go to the gym, we all do yoga, we do meditation. Um, but what are some of those other things that you've done to actually help you? My children, my wife, I look at them every day. That's a huge motivation fa motivating factor. Um, my father-in-law is a great example. He's, he's the next one in line as my father. And uh, like I said, I lost my father. I look to my father-in-law for a lot. He reminds me a lot of my grandfather. He's also a military veteran. My whole family is veterans. Um, my father-in-law is a veteran. He's accepted me for who I am since day one, even after I went through all that with his daughter. And now that I have a daughter, I can't imagine what he was feeling. Um, he's always been by my side. And uh, he showed me what it means to be a real man and to be respectful and um, that it's okay to be a real man and reach out to talk to others if you need to. And that, like you said, I'm not the only one that's depressed or angry. So it's okay. Thank you. No further questions. Ms. Indozo? No questions at this time. Thank you. Dr. Paz de, Mar de Martinez? <laughs> Let, let me see if I can frame the question. Um, you just answered about the depression. Mm -hmm. What made you angry? Well, what was making me angry a long time, like I said, was me not being where I thought I should be in life. I've gotten over that. Um, uh, I've gotten past that. Um, things that make me angry now are probably what things that make everybody else angry, you know? I mean, and when I mean angry, it's not on a level like, I might be upset for like, you know, a couple seconds and then I, I get over it. But like, I, I guess the only thing that could make me angry now would me would be me. I'm in control of that, not anybody else. Cause there's things that are gonna happen every day. Get cut off on the road, um, you know, whatever. You get an unexpected bill. I mean, there's just so much that can make you angry and I've learned that. And I don't wanna spend my life being angry. That's the main thing. I, I, I'm, I'm in a good place. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm happy. And I, I don't want to run around being angry. I don't want my children to see that. I don't want to be like that. And it's just too much negative energy. I'm just burnt out with it. I'm 47 years old. I just want to move on and be peaceful and, and, and do what I got to do. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Amazola? <clears throat> no comment. No questions. Uh, Mr. Durking? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pike, I just want to be clear on the number of uh, DUIs. Yes, sir. You had one. How many was it total? Three. Okay, you had one in 1998. 
Yes. Okay, and then in 2000? Yes. 2003? So there's four. Four, sorry, yeah, 98, I forgot. So it should be uh, four of them, but one got uh, taken off the record. I apologize for that. All right, thank you. That's all, Your Honor. Sure. Mr. Sellers? Yeah, I guess I do have a follow-up question. So other than when you were court-ordered, yes. you've never seeked outside help. You've never been to a, seen a psychologist. You, 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 you claim to have depression. You, you've had some significant setbacks. It sounds like a, not, not making light football career, your military career. You have a significant history of, of drinking. Um, you have anger issues. You have uh, alcohol issues. And then you said something to the effect that uh, your father-in-law said that uh, re real men reach out to others. He said it's okay for a real man to it's reach out. It's real okay, from, yes. but yet you have never reached out to others. Oh, I have, and I have been. When? Tell me, tell me the time. I just reached out before this meeting. I called my father-in-law and... and uh, other than the, the two or three people in your immediate circle, any professional help, any professional assistance ever that um, I'm mandated to? I went to a couple meetings with my mother, a couple NA meetings, mm -hmm. um, just to see what was going on. Because um, uh, there was no AA meetings around for that particular day, but uh, no, no, I haven't seeked any professional help. I why, do you, why do you reach out to your father-in-law? What is the purpose in reaching out to your father-in-law? Or your? I, I, first of all, I like him. I respect him. He's got great knowledge, and um, he leads by example. And everything he's done has been been fantastic. Everything that he showed me, the way to be a, a grandfather, a father, a father-in-law, just just his way of life. So he may have insight that you don't have. He de definitely had a lot of insight I didn't have. So, so it's valuable to get the opinions and reflections of others around you. Absolutely. Okay. I'm always susceptible, open for that too. Any positive or. But you've negative. never, you've never reached out for any assistance for other than. No, sir. If it wasn't court ordered or anything like that, no, I haven't. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Ms. Norton. <clears throat> Uh, can you tell me something that you learned in anger management? Stop and think before you act. And you mentioned that you don't want to spend your life angry. Correct. All right. So um, that's kind of a mindset. And, and I appreciate the fact that you actually took ownership of the fact that the only person that can really make you angry is yourself. Right. Um, I guess probably the concern that we're all struggling with is that you seem to do well right now, but you haven't reached out for any professional kind of therapy. And it is likely that if we were to reinstate your license, we would require that. And I would be somewhat concerned that you would be doing it just to check a box. And so if, if you are granted your license back, I would just hope that you would take that at value and get value out of it as opposed to just checking a box because you're required to do so, because it does seem that you only do things that you are court ordered to do. So. Yes, ma'am, if I can comment on that. Um, I, and I know how that seems, and, and that is correct. I did only the things that the court ordered. I would be willing to not just check the box. Um, I'm at that stage, like I said, if I'm into something, I'm all in. I'm not that guy that I was when I was in my 20s or early 30s. I'm not that person anymore. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any additional questions? Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Mr. Pike, is there anything else that you would like to add before the board? Um, uh, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. And do you have any other witnesses you wanted to call? No. Okay. And then in that case, this petition hearing has concluded. The record is closed and the case is submitted. We can go off the record. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next case will be Olivia Vallejo. Thank you, Mr. Steinheimer.
Mr. Stone, is that, thank you. Okay, let's go back on the record. Good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record before the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians to review the petition for reinstatement by Olivia Vallejo. This is Office of Administrative Hearings case number 2019-101010. My name is Tiffany King, and I am the Administrative Law Judge with the OAH, who is assigned to preside over this matter. Prior to going on the record, all board members did identify themselves, and we do have a quorum of the board present. If I could please have the appearance of counsel for the record, Mr. Stone. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the board. My name is Jeff Stone, Deputy Attorney General. I'm appearing on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522 and Business and Profession Code Section 2878.7, representing the people of the state of California. Thank you, and I will note for the record, Ms. Vallejo, that you are present and representing yourself. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And were you previously advised you could have hired an attorney to represent you? Yes, Your you? Honor. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Vallejo, were you present when I gave instructions to the petitioners yes, this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Did you understand um, my instructions regarding this proceeding? Yes, Your Honor. And did you have any questions before we begin? No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stone, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the... Uh, I think it is on. You might just need to move it closer to your, your mouth. Better? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, bringing your attention to the exhibit folder, uh, which uh, I provided to your honor and which the board member should have, uh, I would like to mark uh, for identification and offer into evidence as exhibit one, the petition packet with accompanying documents. Uh, exhibit one consists of the petition for reinstatement of license dated December 1st. 2018, uh, that's at A001 through A017. Following that is petitioner's supporting documentation, which generally consists of six letters of character reference uh, at A018 through A023, and records regarding courses and training taken, uh, which can be found at A024 through A035. There's a certification of license history dated September 20th, 2019 at B001 and a notice of hearing and related correspondence at C001 through C009. Exhibit one also includes the decision and order in BVNP T case number VN 20124110, effective September 9th, 2015, that's at D001 through D016. And at this time, I would like uh, Exhibit 1 to be introduced into evidence. Ms. Vallejo, do you have any objection? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 1 is admitted? At this time, uh, then, Your Honor, I would uh, like to provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board. Uh, petitioner's vocational nurse license number is VN 210019 and was first issued July 8, 2004. An accusation was filed against a petitioner August 19th, 2014, alleging business and profession code uh, violations for unprofessional conduct, uh, procuring a certificate by fraud or misrepresentation, making false statements in connection with an application for a license, commission of an act involving dishonesty, and misrepresentation of licensure status. The underlying facts regarding these causes for discipline with that on or about November 12th, 2010, petitioner signed an application for licensure by examination for the Board of Registered Nursing under penalty of perjury. Respondent falsely stated in the application that she had graduated and received a baccalaureate degree and that she had never been licensed as an LVN. Petitioner also submitted further signed documentation falsely detailing her collegiate background and submitted a fake diploma and fake transcript. The accusation also alleged, alleges causes for discipline for commission of an act involving dishonesty and misrepresenting licensure status in regard to 
allowing her sister, who was not licensed, to treat a patient as an LVN and then petitioner herself signing the nursing notes to make it appear as if petitioner had actually treated the patient. A petitioner and the board agreed to a stipulated surrender of her license, which was effective September 9, 2015. Um, and uh, uh, investigation and prosecution costs were ordered uh, to be paid by pet petitioner in an amount of $4,878. Uh, no payment has been made toward those costs. Uh, petitioner is now here requesting that the board reinstate uh, her vocational nursing license. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Vallejo, I first want to ask, do you have any additional documents you wanted to yes, present to the board? Make sure that Mr. Stone has a copy and then, and then bring up your other copies. Three pages? Okay, so Ms. Vallejo, the, the first document is a November 10, 2019 um, letter for Norma yes. Amezcua. That's A-M-E-Z-C-U-A. Is this a, a character letter? Uh, that's a volunteer. A volunteer a letter. Volunteer. Um, the next letter is undated. It's uh, authored by Yesenia Andrade. Oh, yes. Yesenia is Y-E-S-E-N-I-A. And is this also a support a character. letter? Character. Character reference. The third is an email dated November 6, 2019 from a Marlene Michael. Um, evaluation. Th I'm sorry, this is an evaluation from your employer? or uh, Yes, school? from the employer. Okay. So our, the letter from uh, Ms. Amez Mezcua as Exhibit 2, the letter from Ms. Andrade as Exhibit 3, and the evaluation email as Exhibit 4. Mr. Stone, have you had a chance to review exhibits two through four? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Are there any objections to these three documents being there admitted? There are no objections. Thank you. Two through four are admitted. Your Honor, just a note on the email, uh, as was brought up by Mr. Swenson earlier, it appears to have a client's name on it. Okay. I'll read that. I, I see it one time under notes. Is that where it is, or is there another spot that I'm that, missing? That's it? where I saw it, Your Honor. Just the one time. So that will be redacted, and I will also issue a protective order in this case that provides that only the redacted version of this document should be produced um, to the public. Anything else, Counsel? Uh, no, thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Vallejo, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the evidence you will give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And whenever you're ready, ma'am, you may give your statement to the board. Okay. I just want to say that I'm extremely remorseful of my accusations. Uh, signing the blank application was the worst mistake of my life. Since I surrender my license, I'm very, very involved in church. We do many, I go to many seminars. We feed the homeless. Uh, when we get donations, we distribute them to the less fortunate. Uh, we do a lot of paintings at uh, families' homes. And I also volunteer in a child care. Uh, I just want to move on in life, and I would like to have an active LVN so I can take my RN exam. I did finish an RN exam. That's all. Thank you. Um, we'll take questions from the board uh, next. Dr. Mountain. Thank you. G uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon. So could you clarify for me, you finished an RN program, or was it a 30-unit th option? It's a 30-unit option, LVN to RN. And, and can I ask where you did that at? I did it at Shepherd University. At Shepherd Los University. Angeles. And how long ago was that? Uh, that was, I graduated in 2012. 2012. So, and then you? I took my, uh, I graduated 2012. I did a testing 2013. I did not pass. I did a te I f sent in an application to test again in 2014. But when I turned it in, they told me that all my paperwork was in the enforcement. Uh, 
I guess they're in charge of the, the, the investigation was going on. So I never heard from them until I tried applying again before I had to surrender my license. And I couldn't uh, take the boards because I did not have an active LVN. So this was after um, jo you met Joanne Keeney? And yes, she when I went back to school, yes. Uh, the other question I had after reading through this, did you pay her $30,000? I had to pay her because she kept on calling me and wanting money. So she kept on harassing me. She kept on calling me that she would not leave me alone, that she knows where I live. She knew everything about me, and if I did not pay her the 30000 she would not leave me alone. I, I'm sorry, she did not what? what? Not leave her alone. What's the last thing you said? Not leave her alone. Can you repeat your last sentence, uh, Ms. Joanne? Joanne will not leave me alone until I pay her the $30,000. Thank you, Your Honor. A after she submitted the false documentation, did, you did not sit for NCLEX or you did sit for NCLEX? After she, no. With her application, I did not sit for NCLEX. You did not sit for NCLEX until you finished the Until I unit finished option. the RN program from Shepherd University. So, Ms. Vallejo, I do need you to allow the full question to be asked before you answer, just okay. so we have a clean I'm record. Sorry. Thank you. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Ms. Turner? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. So, it's your position that you signed a blank yes. application. All right. And you didn't read it. Can I tell you? Oh, yeah. Before yeah. you turned it in. Or did she turn it in? She did. All right. I was told that she will uh, after, because when I met her, we were going to do, I've been to the Philippines twice. Same, for school, I even slept at a dorm. But when I came back, it, they told me it didn't work out. So she reached out to me. She said, I'm going to help you. I'm going to send you books, like an online, kind of like an online. And when we met, she said, I just need you to sign an application. I did not think she was going to send turn it into the boards, but it was blank. And what did you think was going to happen with it? I just with didn't think she was, in, she was going to turn it in. I mean, who right. does that? Who just, right. I, I mean, I really, I didn't think she was going to turn in and put false information in there. Right. But you gave her some personal information about you, right, in order for her to complete the application? It was I mean, just, she must have had a name, an address, a yeah, phone number. Yeah, because that's how the school was going to go. She had, the, she had to have that information to, give, to go through the school mm -hmm. to send me the books that I had to do online. I see. All right. And you said you paid her $30,000? Yes, I had to pay her or else she would not leave me alone. She kept on harassing me every week until I paid her $30,000. I did not hear from her. And when did you discover that the application had been turned in? I got a letter from the boards. So, Ms. Vallejo, again, allow the question to oh. be fully asked before you begin your answer. Okay. Thank you. Can, can you repeat your question, Ms. Turner? I'm sorry. Yes, I asked, uh, when did she find out that the application had been turned in um, with false information? I, I received a letter from the boards. And let's see. You haven't paid anything towards the cost recovery that the BNV... BV and PT incurred as a result of the investigation, have you? Not yet. Why not? I just, I, right now I'm having financial problems. And, let's see. Now you have a letter from a Susan Trong. Does she know um, about your circumstance? Yes, all the character letters I, that I turned in know about my problem. All right. About and in looking at your letter, your request for your license back, I think this is, must be the shortest letter I've ever seen, That just that you would like to petition to, to reinstate your license, period, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to add more information about why you want to and why we should? Because I, 
of nursing is all I know. I've done it since I was 18 years old. And that is my passion. And right now that I haven't had a, my license, uh, it's been so hard for me. But I'm a very good person and I'm, sh I'm a good nurse too. So that's why um, I don't, I'm not good at letters, that's why it was in none, but um, I'm a very good nurse. What makes you a good nurse? I do it with passion. All right, well, you'll be filling out charts and other documentation, other medical documentation, and you know that it's important not to sign something without having the information there. In, you know, you need to input it and you need to be accurate and truthful and you need to put it there and then sign it. You understand that, right? Yes, definitely. All right, thank you. Ms. Carpenter? Yes, I'm curious about the situation with your sister using your license. Does your oh. sister have um, a background in any medical field? She was a CNA, but I want, I mean, I knew, I know they accused me of me signing. I never signed anything, and there's no proof that I signed. How did she get a hold of your license? No, she, they asked her, I guess. I never knew until the investigation was going on. She, I guess she gave my information. Everything's in the, online. Um, when you were an LVN, did you ever have any disciplinary issues or any problems? Never, never. Okay, thank you. Mr. Maxey. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Vallejo. Yeah, um, you continue to use the words passion, and I'm a passionate person as well. I, I think passion is important for any profession that you have. What other adjectives would you use about why you think you should be reinstated to being an LVN? Um, let's see. Um, I take good care of them. I do it with my heart. I try to please them. I. Uh, um, Okay, if you can't answer that question. Um, what about, do you take any personal responsibility for what happened? I, that I signed that application. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest uh, mistake. And do you, do you have remorse? Yes, if I think of this every day, I come extremely remorseful of what happened, of what, I mean, I could be an RN right now, but because of this, I'm here. No further questions, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Endoso. No questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Baste Martinez. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wanna make sure we're understanding <coughs> how all this happened. How did you come to know the woman who brought this paperwork to you? One of the students from when I went to the Philippines. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. Y you were in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and what happened? Uh, we were at a dorms there at La Salette University. Mm -hmm. We were taking a summer class. Once we came back, they told us that that was not gonna go through. So a classmate offered to have Ms. Keeney's help, that she was gonna help me with, uh, with another college and that she was gonna send me the paper, the online courses and everything. Okay. You had always been in the Philippines to do this study. Is no, no, I just went for the summer. Just for the summer? For the summer. Hmm. 
were there other students who were going to get help from the same person? I'm not sure. When we came back from the Philippines, everybody went, went their own way. I don't talk to any of the other students who went. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you immediately trusted this person. I trusted this person. Help us understand what happened that helped you trust. You know, sometimes we meet someone we don't quite feel. Sometimes we say, mm, they're trustworthy. Help us understand why you felt you could trust this person. Cause she would, I mean, you want to hear, she would say, I'm going to help you. I'm going to send you one book a month. Uh, this is going to go through. And you ju what you want to hear, you just got back from the Philippines and they're telling you it's not going to go through. Uh, you wasted all your money, all your time there. And you come back and they tell you the good things you want to hear. I, it was my fault. I did not investigate a little further of what college or who was she or, I mean, I I want to say that it's my fault for trusting her. So if I'm hearing you correctly, as unpleasant as this was, there were some lessons learned. Yes. Okay. I uh, cannot trust anybody. I mean, um, with this, I mean, it ruined my life for three and a half years already. <laughs> okay. Now, your sister mm -hmm. um, used your license. Mm -hmm. And if I heard correctly, you said your sister had your information and because everything's online, that happened? Uh, no, I'm saying that she probably got my LVN license number there. Uh -huh. I mean, she knows, because she knows me. She knows where I live. She knows everything about me. Okay. And how did you discover, you said when you went forth with, and were told you could not apply for the other license, then this came up. When the investigation, there was an investigation. That's right. where I found out that they... Uh, they asked me if I had signed some route sheets mm -hmm. from her. I said, no, I didn't even know she was working under me, and I never signed anything. Okay. And you're, where is your sister now? Uh, she's in Los Angeles. I see. And still using your license no, to no, your knowledge? No, no. no. Okay. no. All right. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Ms. Amazola? Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, what did you think you were signing up when you went to the Philippines? What was that? It's an international, it was an inter, when I went in, I stood at the uh, uh, college. It, it was an international program for LVNs to RNs. And what, what was the course requirements, what did that look like? Uh, it was like a regular RN school. I mean, it was a, it was La Salette and it was a RN, LVN to RN. We were uh, discussing math, like if you just start an RN program. So it's usually math, uh, body systems, everything about the body. It was just a summer class. <clears throat> so, are, I'm trying to understand this. One summer class uh -huh. in the Philippines was uh -huh. going to turn your LVN to an RN. No, it was. It was. We just went to meet the school. But no, that was not going to complete the program. It's an international, so we went to meet the school. When we come back to LA, that's where we were going to do an international. They were going to videotape all the classes and everything. That's what, online. Okay. But that was not a complete program or anything. We, it was just like an introduction to the international program. So I'm trying to understand. So you went to the Philippines and with an introdu introductory course, uh -huh. and then you returned, and they said 
when you say, explain to me what it means, it did not work out. What they does that mean? It, oh, sorry. They said it was not legal here. So their program that they were planning was not going to translate to the academic program or curriculum that's required in the United States? Yes. Okay, so they said, this this international program is not for you yes. because you want to practice in the United States. Yes. And you were disappointed. Yes. And then and then what happened? That's when we came back, I came back and they introduced me to Kini and she said that she was that their program was good and that she was gonna help me. Who's they? The, the students, when we came back, when we came back from the P Philippines. So there were students, one student who referred me to Kini. Okay. One student referred you and said like, here's, a, here's another program yes. for you to consider. Yes. Okay. And you receive forms that were empty. Yes. And these forms? The application. The application. You, were, you signed it. Did it say you're going to pay $30,000? No. How did you pay for $30,000? Uh, she, okay. So when I, when I signed up with Kini, it was, I had to give a down payment of 5000 then after, I guess, she turned in the application, she put the information, and it didn't, she kept on asking me for money. Then I get a letter from the board saying that it was false information. And she still, she, I, she, that's when she kept on harassing me, she wanted her money. So did you pay $35,000? I had to, she wouldn't or leave me alone. 30. Oh. 35? 30. So you did 5000 uh, so twenty five, and then you gave another twenty five thousand. I had and to be giving her payments. So you five. did it in payments. She had to. Yes, she wouldn't leave me alone until I paid her thirty thousand dollars. And you're making these <coughs> payments on a regular basis, and she's not sending you any books. What are you thinking? No, that's when I found out when I got the letter from the boards. I, this was a scam. It everything's false. Okay, so you're telling me you're making payments. I'm, I'm just really trying to understand. You're making payments. You got a letter from the board. And you still kept on making payments? I had to. She kept on calling me. She kept on telling me. It was me. a scam and you didn't report it to the police? Uh, no. She said that if I would report something, they wouldn't believe me. I had to just pay her that money for she could leave me alone. I, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Mr. Durking? <coughs> yes, thank you, Your Honor. So you testified that you knew your application would be submitted. Uh, I didn't think she was going to turn it in right away. I thought, till I finish, of course, I, she would turn it in. Okay, so you signed the application. I signed the application, how, blank application. And how many times did you meet with any person to sign the application? One time. Okay, well, looking at the uh, accusation, just to refresh your recollection, because you did subsequently file uh, a, uh, sign off on a stipulation. On or about November 12, 2010, you signed an application on the first page. The second page was not signed, so subsequently, January 5th, 2010, almost two months later, mm -hmm. you signed the second page, right? Yes, I believe there was a, she mailed it to me. She said she, the second page was missing. Right, and that's corroborated by the elements in the accusation. We, yes. we asked you how many times you signed, and you said once. 
because when I saw her the first time, that's when I, I signed. I remember signing both. Okay, so how many times did you sign okay. an application to the BRN in total? Two. <clears throat> All right, you said you signed the first and the second page on the first occasion, and then on a subsequent uh, date in January, then you signed the second page again. Yes. Okay. And then there's the issue about your sister using your license. Mm hmm Did you know she was employed at that time? I knew she was working. What did you think she was doing? I, I thought she was a caregiver. <coughs> I never signed anything. There is no proof because I never signed anything for her route sheets or anything like that. I have nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Oh, yeah. Um, following up on what Mr. Durking was asking, so the, the second time you signed, was that application sent back to you? Did you receive that application physically? It was mailed to me. It was empty. And it was empty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was a box on that, that uh, on that second one that said, that was checked no, uh, whether you'd ever been licensed in a, as an LVN. So you had to have checked that box. No, no I you, just how, signed. How, wait, wait a minute. How can that be? You said it was a blank document when you got it. And then you signed it and sent it back. It was a blank application. Right. And uh, who'd you send it back to? Keeney. You sent it back to her, not back to the board. Why wouldn't you send it no, back? No, because I didn't think she was going to turn it in because I hadn't oh, completed it. No, the second time. Oh. The second time when the second page was, was, was not filled out properly. Well, you signed the original one with her. And then later, as, as Mr. Durkin pointed out in January, the, it said that the had not you had not completed the second page of the application application uh, therefore it was returned to you and on the t fifth you signed this second page of the application that's what it says here that's what's in the and you mm -hmm. said you got a blank application why would you send it you send it back to keening why wouldn't you send it back to the board it came from the Be board because i thought she had it i mean, she still had the application. Why would she send it in if I hadn't completed it? Okay. Um, I, I guess I'm also a little confused about why. So you, you graduated in, in uh, July of 2004. You had gone to American Career College. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're familiar with the concept of accreditation. Yes. Yes. Accredi you, know what, you know what an accredited school is, right? Yes. You, you, why, why were you trying to get into all of these seemingly unaccredited schools, including Keeney's, uh, when there are hundreds of schools here in the state that would certainly for $30,000, you could have, you could have gotten your, your license legally and directly. Why did you go down this other path? They just, uh, just seemed like, cause it was going to be BSN. That's the only reason. It would be but easier. It would be easier to do it this way. Excuse me. It would be easier. Probably easier. Probably easier. Okay. <clears throat> did, did it ever occur to you when this woman, who was clearly extorting you for money, when she said, "Oh, um, they wouldn't believe me." You, did, 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 does that make sense to you? That people, that the authorities wouldn't believe you? That the, that this person, would you, do you believe that? That nobody would have believed you if you had said, hey, I got scammed? Yeah, I I mean, I couldn't report it. I mean, I'm going to look bad. I mean, I look bad. I look bad already. right now. I look bad already, so I couldn't report it. I mean, it was already a big mess. I just wanted to move on. And that's why I just decided I'm just going to go to school here. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Norton? 
Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I need, just need to do a little bit of clean up here a little bit for my own brain. Um, so first of all, you signed a stipulated settlement that you admitted that everything in the settlement was true. Um, and now you're saying that it's not true. Because I had to. You, uh, I had to. You had to. Okay. So you're aware that you stipulated the truth of what you signed in your okay. Mm -hmm. So then let's go back in time. Um, when did you pay? When did you pay the thirty thousand dollars? Regardless of whether it was twenty five and five, I don't I don't really care. But when did you pay the thirty thousand? What year? Uh, probably like by like twenty twelve. 2012? I think so. Um, you mentioned a few times that you didn't think that Keeney was going to turn in the application. Yes. When did you think she was going to turn in the application? Until I finished. Until you finished what? Until I finished the whole course, the RN course. But you weren't enrolled in an RN course at that time. No, she said she was gonna. We were gonna start. She was gonna start sending me the all the courses. Uh -huh. But she never did. She turned in the application with the false accusation, okay. with the false documentation. Okay. And you got something from the Board of Registered Nursing, correct? Yes. That your documents were false. Yes. Okay. Um, I thought that was in 2010. When I met her was 2010. Okay. So this happened in 2010. Mm -hmm. Paid the money. You found out it was a scam. Mm -hmm. And then in 2012, you decided to go to Shepherd University. Yes. A couple years later to actually finish the program. Yes. Okay. Did you and your sister work for the same company? Worked in the same company? No. No? No. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Stone, do you have any questions? Uh, I have a few uh, follow-up questions. Thank you. Have you uh, talked to your sister about the, um, uh, the issue of her uh, using your uh, name and number? Yes. And uh, what did she tell you about that? She denied it. But I told her there was an investigation, and they told me. Is there any reason why you didn't uh, follow up with having a hearing and um, having your sister have to answer questions about what happened? No. Is there a reason why you didn't um, want to use the, uh, the, the process and the hearing process to get to the um, heart of the matter or the truth of the matter regarding uh, these people who had um, uh, unfairly treated you and jeopardized your, your license? No. It, why, why didn't you want to use the process to get to the, to the bottom of, of what happened? Well, I didn't know that when that investigation was until I, I got interviewed um, in 20, the last time I got interviewed, I believe it was 2014. 2013, that's when he told me that they had proof and that they found that my sister was working with my license. I never heard of anything before that. But, and, and your sister denied that? When I told her that that's what the officer told me, the FBI agent told me, that she was using, she just said, no, I wasn't. That was all. Now, going... Um to the matter with uh, Miss Keeney, um, when did Miss Keeney first mention um, being paid for her services to you? Well, at first she just told me I had to put a down payment of five thousand. 
When was the next time she discussed money with you? I called her about getting the letter from the board saying that I was false accusation, and that's when she said, you're still going to pay me 30000 total of $30,000. When did you first learn that Ms. Cuny had submitted your application to the board? When I got the letter from the board. Uh, when you received the letter from the board, did you contact the board telling them that you did not submit an application? No. Why not? I reached out to Keeney and I asked her why did she do that and she said, well, uh, that's when I found out that there was a scam that she just wanted money from me and that she, I had to pay her. Did you, um, did you think it was curious that you were signing a blank document under penalty of perjury? I did, but I didn't think, like I told you, I didn't think she would turn it in because I had not completed anything. Did you um, ask her why you were signing it when it was blank? Yes, and she said, well, this is what I'm going to turn in when you finish because I don't know when will be the next time we see each other. Well... You could sign it if she mailed it to you, completed, you could sign it or sign it from email and print it out. There's all sorts of ways of signing it. Did, um, did you ask her any follow-up questions about why you were signing it at that time? Yes, I, I told her I didn't even complete anything and I've been a CNA before and I mean, why are you putting false information? That's when she said, well, that's when she was telling me that I mean, I guess she, uh, it was false and that I had still had to pay. Well, I'm talking about <clears throat> when she first asked you to sign and mm -hmm. you did sign mm -hmm. uh, the blank documents. Mm -hmm. um, did you ask her why you had to sign them before they were filled out? Yes, she said she was just going to keep them there. And you believe that? I did at that time. Have you ever uh, had a circumstance um, before or since uh, where you signed um, a blank document of importance, like under penalty of perjury or um, uh, an application for something? No. Uh, did it seem odd to you at the time that she asked you to do that? It did, and that's why I asked her, why is this? She said, oh, I just have to keep it as a document, and I will turn it in when you finish. Did you, uh, since you were curious about it, did you raise the issue with anyone, either at the board or um, a friend or family member or some other practitioner? No. Is there a reason why you didn't seek out um, assistance or help from other uh, professionals or from uh, the board regarding um, what was happening with you? Uh, no. Uh, what have you learned um, since this time about, about um, what you did and how to prevent something like that? Whatever. I can't trust anybody. i am never, ever sign anything and first find out from the school. That's why before I went to Shepherd University, I checked if they were uh, accredited here, and that's why I finished the course. I learned many. I mean, I can't trust. Uh, I've, from that, I make better decisions. Uh, are there some types of um, uh, tools or mechanisms you, that you use um, uh, when you're faced with uh, difficult situations that you don't know in order to uh, gain more understanding and uh, to avoid any other occurrences like this? Occurrence? Can you repeat it again? Yeah. Um, is, is, there, is there something that you um, have learned to do or uh, something that you've adopted in terms of how you approach things, um, like signing documents or filling out documents? Uh, is there something that you now uh, do or have put in place uh, which um, 
uh, you think will help uh, prevent something like this from happening again? Yeah, read everything and search. Search for any, if I'm planning of going to another school, I have to really investigate the school, um, read any documentation that I'm signing, Have you ever been uh, in any other circumstance, um, uh, either with uh, uh, the state uh, or a licensing agency or an employer, where um, you've been faced with an instance where uh, um, you've been accused of doing something that was inaccurate or dishonest? Never, never. This is the first time I've been in this type of situation. Now, I, I noticed in, your, uh, in the references that you've submitted uh, and I think you testified that, that um, the people who gave the references were aware that you'd had problem with your license and your license was suspended um, uh, or surrendered. Uh, uh, did, you, um, did you tell the people who gave the references the circumstances that there, there was a false information, a false transcript uh, I did. in the application? I did. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll panel the board one more time. Dr. Mountain? Yes, one last question. Do, do you know anyone else who signed up with Joanne Keeney? I do. You do. It was that the person who kind of recruited you? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Yes. Um, was it your understanding that the $30,000 was to pay for what? School and help with an application or just help with an application? No, it was going to be for the, it was 5000 then she said for the school, for the school. Did you ever receive any contracts to attend school or anything that would document that you were going to enroll in any school? That was the plans. That was the plan? That was the plan. When I met Keeney, she was talking about the school and everything, I'm going to send you everything by mail about the school, your, the contract for the school, everything about the school. So $5,000 but no contract to sign up to attend the school? Yes. All right. And who sent you the second page for you to sign the second time? Keeney. Okay. So it didn't come from, and, and it was blank again? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Um, I'm curious, was there ever any investigation into your sister's use of your license that resulted in a punishment to her? I, I believe so, yes. Oh, okay. I thought it was a little unfair that you no, th bore that the was. entire brunt of it. Um, no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxey. Yes, I have a, a few. I'm, I'm having a couple challenges today with uh, this particular situation. Um, my first question is, um, when you attended American College, or before you attended American College, Career College, did you do any research into that college? Yes. I didn't know what LVN College to go to, so I looked up for uh, different colleges that I could go to for LVN. And this was prior to, to the Philippines? Yes. Right. Um, do you have mentors that you actually relate to today that actually give you advice? A lot. I have a lot of RNs that I work with. Did, did Miss Keening threaten your life? Yes. She did threaten your life? Yes. And it wasn't just because you, earlier you said it wasn't threatening your life, it was more like, she was just going to keep calling you. and if She it, kept on calling me and um, telling me that she knows where I live, that she knows everything about me, and that she could send out people to do something to me. So she actually stated yes. that she would have people do something yes. to you. That's the only reason why I paid everything, the $30,000, for she would leave me alone. And at no time you contacted any law enforcement, family, friends to tell them, that this was something that you were experiencing? No. Um, what is your understanding today of penalty and perjury? Say the truth, nothing but the truth.
after Keening gave you your school program, did you think at any time, I mean, this is the age of technology, to go online and look and use a search engine and just say, hey, what, what is this school? I didn't think of, since it was in the Philippines, it's harder to uh, get the information. I didn't, I didn't go into investigating more of that college. It's hard for me to believe that because I don't believe we do anything without a little bit of question in, what, in regards to everything we do in life. So I'm going to ask you again. And you, first you of never, all, she you, you wasn't never, sure of what college I was going. They were going to put me in. So you never went online no. to actually do a search of it. No. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Indozo. No questions. Dr. Basti Martinez. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Amazola. No questions. Mr. Durking. I, yes, Your Honor. Just a couple to clarify. So you started making payments uh, to the person when? Uh, ever s since after I got the letter from the boards. No, That's no, no. when she kept on. Your first payment to her was 5000 When I met her. Okay. And when did you make that payment? Um, I don't remember the exact, exact date. Okay, what year was it? I believe it was in 2010. I can't remember. All right, so you made a payment in 2010. When was the next payment? Uh, right after I started getting the, the letter from the board. That's when she was uh, asking me for payments. You got a letter from the board and then you sent her payments? Because that's when she kept on calling me and telling me that if that if I did not give her payment, she would continue to she will go to my house or she kept on calling me that she knew where I lived and everything. Okay, listen, please listen very carefully. You didn't make the next or subsequent payment until you got a letter from BRN. Uh huh. So you were already advised that your application was not going to be accepted uh -huh. and the reasons for that mm -hmm. and you continued to send her money? I had to. Well, she will not leave me alone. So when did you get the letter from BRN? That I don't know the date. All right, would it help if I told you that you got a, re a letter from, um, okay, you, you recall re uh, talking to investigators, correct? Mm -hmm. And do you remember when that was? The, uh, 2013? I don't know the months. Uh, yeah, if it would refresh your recollection, our records here show December 2013. 2013. Okay, so, BRN received the documentation with the application in March of 2010. 2010. Mm. Subsequent to that, the registrar of the school in the Philippines sent uh, correspondence to the BRN in April of 2011 saying these are uh, forged and fictitious documents. Mm -hmm. So you would have received a letter from BRN sometime after April 11th of 2011, is that right? Mm-hmm, yes. So you made a payment in 2010 of $5,000, and then a year and a half later, in April 2011, you paid 25000 Yes, if that's how long, I'm so in this, you know, year or two period, what were you doing as far as, you know, expecting, you know, where's, where's the course for the money? Well, I was working. No, no. The, the course that you were, you, you indicated you were going to take to qualify for uh -huh, the BRN. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I called her. I kept on telling her what's going to happen. Are you going to send me the, uh, the, what she said, the books? the online course and everything, and she said, 
I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Okay, so for two years she's working on it. Okay, and you didn't quest further question about it. I had I I was no. Okay, and then just a clarifying question on on your sister. Uh -huh. Did she give you documents uh, to sign indicating she made a uh, home visit to a patient? No. So investigators would never have shown you a document that was purportedly your signature? No. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Um, yeah, I, I think I have just a couple of follow-ups. Just to make, me, help me understand, but Ms. Keeney, was she in the United States or in the Philippines? In the Philippines. She's in the Philippines and you're here mm -hmm. while this is happening. She would also... Uh, in San Jose. I heard that she was in San Jose. She was staying at, uh, when I met her, when I met her that she said that she was staying in San Jose. So so when you met her, you met her here in the United States yes. in in California in San yes. Jose. How did you pay her? Uh, by cash or checks cash. or money orders? Cash. Cash. So you were sending Oh, uh, to the Philippines money orders. Money orders. Mhm. Mm no receipts of any type? I have them at home. You have the receipts? Mm -hmm. You Have you ever shown them to the the board or to any of the people under mm. these kind no. of hearings? Why? I don't know. I <clears throat> No one has asked for it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Seems like the longer we go on, the muddier the water gets here. Um, now I'm just really trying to get this timeline down straight. Because you signed the papers in 2010. You just testified that the first indication that, at least I understood you to testify, that the first indication that you got that, every, that things were awry was when you got the notice from the BRN. But that was in 2013. Correct? Mm -hmm. Why did you go to Shepherd University in 2012 then? No, then I didn't get the letter from the board in um, 2013 from Keeney. It was before. I started Shepherd University in 2011, 7, 7, 2011 to December 2012. Okay. Keeney's problem was before that, before I started Shepherd University. So that's a reason when I started with all these problems, I just decided to go back to school here. So you're, you're, so you, you met Keeney, you thought she was going to start sending you books from the Philippines. You paid, you paid her a down payment. Um, you signed some papers. And then you just arbitrarily decided, hey, I should go to school in the United States. So you decided to enroll in school. So it was like you were doing two things. You were paying Keeney right. to do something from the Philippines. And at the same time that you were going to Shepherd University. No. The dates are wrong. I went to Shepherd University 2012. Keeney was 2010. I got an approval from the board to sit down and take the test from Keeney's paperwork, but I didn't. I never did. Why? Because it was, it was not right. It was false information, and I still got the approval to sit down and take the boards, but I didn't. With all these problems going on with that school, I, that's when I decided to go to Shepherd University. I have nothing to do from 2012, 2011, 7, 2011. I had nothing to do with Keeney. That's when I started the school. So Keeney never told you that there was a problem? No. You were unaware that she had submitted your application? Yes, she put that I was not a CNA. Okay. The registrar, so the BRN didn't get anything until 2011 stating that the documents were false. 
Mm -hmm. So I still don't understand why you would think you were going down one avenue and then... When, I, when the problem was with Keeney, that's when I just decided to go back to school. I won't do both things. Why would I do that? Okay. I'm going to finish with Keeney and go back to school and start all over with nursing school. Okay. So just to wrap it up, yes. I want to make sure that I understood you. You were unaware of any issues with Keeney until you received a letter from the BRN. Yes. When did you receive that letter? That's what I don't remember. It was before I started school, the RN school. It couldn't have been because the letter from the, the, the letter to the BRN didn't come from the Philippines till 2011. 2011 was from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I started school in 2011 of 7, 2011 in Shepherd. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Stone, any further questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think you, miss, you mentioned Ms. Keeney um, uh, also was, was providing some type of uh, service in regard to applications with uh, someone else that you knew at the someone school? Someone else that I knew. Yeah. And uh, have you ever talked to that person again about Ms. Keeney and what you've gone through with Ms. No, Keeney? No, I haven't seen him. Uh, were you ever concerned that Ms. Keeney what, did you believe Ms. Keeney was doing some type of scam? I, I did, when I got the approval from the board, that's when I knew it was a scam. And um, who do you think she was scamming? Us, all the students, getting money from. And were you concerned that she was scamming other people as well as you? I'm sure she was. Okay, and and uh, what did you do, if anything, um, about trying to... Um, stop Miss Miss Keeney or report Miss Keeney or otherwise do something to try to help other people who might be in your same situation. I didn't do anything. I don't have anything further. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Vallejo, is there anything else that you would like to state to the board? The only thing I would, uh, I need an active uh, LVN license to continue to just, I th took the 30 unit LVN to RN and to take my boards for, as an RN. Thank you. And Ms. Vallejo, do you have any other witnesses you intend to call no. today? Okay, thank you very much. That does conclude this petition hearing. The record is closed, the case is submitted, and we can go off the record. Thank you. Okay. A recess, Your Honor. We have a request down here for a brief recess. Two minutes. I just need. Five minutes five, sure. We're going to take a five minute break. We'll come back on at 3.35. Let's go back on the record. Good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record before the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians to review the petition for early termination of probation by Andrea Matthews. This is OAH case number 2019-101014. My name is Tiffany King. I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I was assigned to preside over this matter. Prior to going on the record, we did have all of the board members identify themselves. I will note for the record that Mr. Maxey uh, has excused himself and is not present. However, we still have uh, a quorum of the board present uh, for this hearing. If I could please have the appearance of counsel for the record, Mr. Stone. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, Your Honor and board members. Uh, my name is Jeff Stone, Deputy Attorney General. 
I'm appearing on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522 and Business and Profession Code Section 2878.7, representing the people of the state of California. Thank you. And Ms. Matthews, I will note that you're present and representing yourself today. Is that correct? And ma'am, I just did want to confirm the spelling of your last name has only one T. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Matthews, were you previously advised you could have retained an attorney to represent you? Yes, I was. Okay, thank you. And you were present when I met with petitioners this morning? Correct. Did you understand my instructions as to how this process would work? Yes. Do you have any questions before we begin? No. Ma'am, is your microphone on? There should be a green light. There is. Okay, if, yes. if you could, you're just a little soft spoken. If you could speak a little louder, it would be helpful. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stone, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first, I would like to mark for identification and offer into evidence as Exhibit 1, the petition packet with accompanying documents, which I have uh, provided to Your Honor and which the board members should uh, each have uh, a copy of. Exhibit 1 consists of the petitioner probation report dated October 11th, 2019 at A001 through A003, petition for early termination of probation dated December 27th, 2018, and supporting documentation at B001 through B010, a certification of license history dated September 20th, 2019 at C001, notice of hearing and related correspondence at D001 through D004. Exhibit one also includes the decision and order in BVNPT case number VN2010-2480, effective February 13th, 2013. That's at E001 through E016. And the last section of Exhibit 1 includes the board's decision on petitioner's petition for reinstatement dated July 11th, 2016. That's at F001 through F010. And at this time, I would like to, I would like Exhibit 1 to be introduced into evidence. Ms. Matthews, is there any objection? No, there isn't. Thank you. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I would like to provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board. Uh, petitioner's vocational nurse license number is VN187620 and was first issued September, March. Oh, uh, actually, I have uh, two dates here. So let me confirm that. Apologize for that. September 20th, uh, 2019. Uh, it was first issued. Bear with me. March 16th, 1999 uh, is when it was first issued. An accusation was thereafter filed against petitioner July 18th, 2012, alleging business and profession code violations for three criminal convictions for driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs in 1997, 2009, and 2010, and related unprofessional conduct. The matter proceeded by default proceedings, and a default decision was adopted by the board January 4th, 2013. Petitioner filed a petition for reconsideration on January 18th, 2013, which was denied on February 13th, 2013. Also on February 13th, 2013, the board's decision became effective and petitioner's license was revoked. On February 22nd, 2016, petitioner filed a petition for reinstatement, which was granted effective August 10th, 2016. Petitioner was placed on probation for four years beginning October 20th, 2016. As for compliance with her probation terms, petitioner submitted several incomplete or late quarterly reports which were corrected. One of petitioner's work performance evaluation forms was submitted a couple of weeks late. A petitioner failed to submit to drug testing once in July 2017 and failed to check in on 27 separate occasions. These violations were determined not to warrant further disciplinary action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Matthews, um, do you have any documents that you wanted to submit to the board today? And have you given a copy to <coughs> Mr. Stone? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, Ms. Matthews, this appears to be four character letters? Yes. Okay. I'm going to collectively mark these four, docu these four pages as Exhibit 2. Oh, sorry. Are there any other copies, Your Honor? Uh, I may have put too many down over here. Do all of the board members now have a copy of Exhibit 2? It appears that they all do. Uh, Mr. Stone, have you had a chance to review Exhibit 2? I have had that chance. Is there any objection to Exhibit 2 being admitted at this time? There's no objection, Your Honor. Thank Exhibit you. Exhibit 2 is so admitted. Ms. Matthews, if I could please ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the evidence you will give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, whenever you're ready, you can present your statement to the board. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you um, to everybody on the board. Um, it's really hard being here. Um, I wanted to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to have my license back. Um, it's been, it was hard when I didn't have my license and it was revoked for those three years. So now having it back on these, um, under these terms and conditions has been, I take it with all heart and I am so grateful that I was offered this opportunity. Um, I have complied with everything that the board has asked me to do. Um, I haven't been into any more trouble since I, started this new journey, you know, with not drinking. Um, I never really had an issue with the drinking part other than I was stupid to drink and drive. Um, since then, you know, I've had a lot of things that could have triggered me to actually go back to maybe drinking and being in, um, irresponsible. Um, the last time I was here, I had mentioned to the board that my father died of from cirrhosis of the liver, being an alcoholic. So that, you know, of course, brought to more to my attention that drinking, of course, is not healthy. Um, since then, in the last couple of years, I found out that he wasn't really my father. He was my adopted father. So, you know, if I did have a trigger that would trigger me to go back to drinking would have been that. Um, you know, I'm very grateful that he was a very good father to me. Um, now I'm exploring to find out who my biological father is. So I would think that if that would be another trigger that would send me back to spiraling to maybe drinking and being irresponsible. Um, since then also, um, I've met a wonderful person that doesn't live here in the state of California. So I have a, a long distance relationship with this man um, who lost his wife a couple years back. And so I am asking to get my early termination so that I can move to the state of Texas. I can easily say, you know, I can put my license on hold here and move, but all I know how to do is be a nurse. And I love what I do. Um, I put my education right now on hold because I was submitting paperwork to the state of Texas um, to see if I can get my license back. Right now they send me a letter telling me that they are sending it to the enforcement. I need you to speak just a, a little bit slower. Okay, sorry. I, I know you're nervous and that's understandable. I am very I'll nervous. Just, just a little bit slower, thank you. Okay. So they um, just recently told me that they're submitting my license to the enforcement division. And then I also submitted a letter telling them that I was going to come here today and ask for an early termination of my license. Um, you know, I can make excuses for my past, but I'm not going to. I take full responsibility for my previous actions. You know, I've grown a lot since then. Um, I've finished raising the last two of my five kids all on my own. Um, my last two kids are actually in school right now trying to get their RN degree as well. And hopefully I can do it before they graduate from being RNs. <laughs> um, you know, basically I just want to say that, you know, I have changed a lot. I have grown from, like I said, my previous mistakes. You know, I have a wonderful support system, not only my family, my children, my coworkers, and my new partner that I'm hoping to move to Texas with and start a new life there and hopefully carry on being a nurse out there. And that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. We're open it for questions from the board, Dr. Mountain. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Thank you for being here. Um, did, uh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> no questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Turner. All right. So the first time around, um, when you uh, were sent an accusation, you allowed a default to occur. What happened? The, uh, what happened then was I had recently moved, and I completely failed to do my change of address. Mm -hmm. So when the paperwork got to my old address and I was at the new address, it didn't come to my attention until it was all forwarded in bulk, you know, and I had missed a time frame to file a, a, a petition for that. And I didn't have the time to react on that because of the mailing situation. Okay. But you understand that you're obligated to keep the board informed of your address yes. changes? Trust me, I, I am informing them of everything I do now. All right. And um, so you were given probation um, for years once you were able to reinstate or come back and ask uh, for reconsideration. Um, it does appear, though, in the beginning that you failed to check in 27 times. Would you explain what happened with yes. that? Yes. Um, there was one actual time that I failed to call in and check in, and actually that date was a, a testing day. The other times, I had told them that I was going on vacation, and I believe that's probably why those are the 27 times. But I informed the board every time that I went out of the state, which was on two cruises and I think three trips to, um, well, all, all the trips were into Mexico, but two of them were cruises, and then the other three or four were family vacations. So I believe that's why the testing shows that I didn't test. But I did inform my probation monitor and uh, Famatech as well. Now you had three convictions for DUI, um, but they seem rather old. One occurred in 2009, and one occurred in 2010, and the other in 2011. Is that right? No. no. One was in 1998. Older than that? Okay. Like, like 97, well, 98, and then the 2009 and 2011. Maybe I'm referring to convictions. Okay. As opposed to the actual incident date. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, they all seem old. Have you taken any steps to request that they be dismissed or expunged? I'm planning to do that because... I took the jurisprudence test in Texas, and they're very, very strict about a lot of, you know, just like California is. Um, and I would like to move if, when I do move, with the clean record. And they are old, and I'm hoping to. That's the next plan. After I'm having a heart procedure done, not really a heart procedure. They're going to put a loop monitor in because I'm having some irregular heartbeats. So once I get done with that in December, I plan to go back and hopefully by the beginning of the year and take care of that. And what is your sobriety date? It's going to be actually nine years next month. Nine years. And are you uh, currently involved in any <coughs> programs? I do go to an AA class once a week. Um, I work a lot. So within my peers of coworkers, we talk about sobriety and not drinking and driving. Our facility that I work for is a teaching facility. So I do, the teachers ask me to come and speak to the students like here and just remind them about the consequences of drinking and driving and the fact that, you know, you work so hard for this license and you should take care of it. You know, we are here to serve the public. And so I, I pretty much, I used to be embarrassed about it and now I use it as a tool for educating younger people. You know, I'm 50 years old almost and I think it's ridiculous that, you know, I wish I had somebody mentoring me like that before. Um, you know, there's a lot of consequences and, you know, an LVN license is a big privilege. And, you know, I think a lot of us don't understand that. All right. And so you were given a four-year probation. Why should we terminate it early? Well, first of all, I think I've proven not only to myself but to the board as well that, you know, I can be trusted. I've never been in trouble at work. Um, I used to work for a sister facility, both hospitals, um, for about 14 or 15 years before my license got revoked. I've been with this facility over five years and I've never had any disciplinary actions towards me. You know, I, I feel that, I, that I've proven, you know, the fact that I can be trusted and not have to be testing it. I mean, it's not a, I don't mind it, 
because I'm here to prove to everybody that I have changed my ways. It's just I'm trying to move to Texas with a clean slate and start a new life. And, you know, I can, like I said, I can easily move but I, and start working as doing something else, but I don't know what else to do other than be a nurse. And I don't want to be a financial burden to my partner. Um, so I would just like to have that opportunity to not have that over me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter? Um, in the notes, it says that um, your 27 occasions um, when you failed to check in, they're considered a violation, but they do not warrant further disciplinary action. So apparently checking in and letting them know was a good move on your part. Right. I, I, yes, I kept a log of every time I would go out and I would make sure I call them, I would fax them, and I would mail them everything so that they would know receipts and everything so they would know the time frames that I was gone. This is a learning moment, students. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I have no further questions. Thank you. Ms. Endozo. I want to congratulate you. That's a very good track record. I mean, trying to do all the probationary terms, and it's difficult. But to only miss a few is, is good. But I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baste Martinez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Since you're at a teaching hospital, would you demonstrate for these students what you say? Would I demonstrate to them what I? What you say about the use of alcohol and its implications? Yes. Um, like I said before, I wish someone would have told me this, how serious it is. You know, drinking and driving don't mix. Even buzz driving is, you can easily kill somebody, injure somebody, and, but most of all, you work so hard to getting this license, and it's a privilege to have this license. You know, and like I said, I wish I had this when I was going to nursing school. They never really talked about the effects of you getting into a car accident and not reporting it or any other type of violation. You know, it is very important because we are serving the community. And if we can't be role models, positive role models, you know, that just that doesn't work together. So, you know. I always tell my coworkers that this was like a blessing in disguise because I used to think, oh, one drink or two drinks, that's nothing. But in reality, that's all it takes. You know, and sometimes some people, some of us don't understand what our limits are. So it has been very easy to stay away from alcohol. I don't miss it. You know, I had a lot of family members who have had health issues, so it's not a problem. But to the students, Take your license very, very serious because it can be taken away in an instant. Thank and thank you. thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amazola. No questions. And Mr. Durking? Yes, Your Honor. Nice work. Thank you, sir. Continued uh, actively working your sobriety. What, what kind of meeting do you go to? I go to an AA meeting. Um, oh, what kind? Big book, step study? No, speakers? I just go to an AA meeting. I do attitude adjustment or we just do um, like a group session and we just talk. Um, like I said, I don't feel like I really, thinking back like to my dad, you know, he always drank and I don't, never had that urge to, I needed to go home and drink. Like I said, I've, I've had uh, things in my life that have triggered to me you know, I could easily turn to alcohol, but I don't. Um, but just listening to different situations, you know, I've had a couple of friends who have their license revoked for the rest of their life, and I don't want to be that person because, like I said, the only thing I know how to do is be a nurse. And I really, really value my nursing license. I understand. And one of the benefits of AA is people get to learn from you. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Yeah, you say you have, um, I mean, you, you, you tell us that you have um, nine years, correct? Next what, month. What, 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 is your, what is your actual sobriety date? It's December 11th. Okay. And you, do, you have a, do you have a sponsor? No. Have you, have you had a sponsor in the past? I just talk to, you know, when I go to the meetings, I just talk to everybody. Um, I have five kids of my own, so if I don't think I have a great family support system, then... You know, I have my parents still, that I'm very blessed to have both of my mom and stepdad. And now in the past almost, he's, he was my friend first before we became 
uh, partners. He's one of the best support systems that I can ever had asked for. You know, he's been through his own life changes and he's helped me grow even more since we became partners. And, you know, like I said, once I move, you know, I hope to just start a new life with him and just put this past us. And he doesn't drink either, so it works. <laughs> have, you, have you worked the steps in the past? No. No? Never. Okay. Um, so the purpose then of, of requesting this early termination is, so if you didn't have the early termination, would you be able to make this move? Would, it, would you be able to? Okay. I could make the move, but financially, I don't want to be a burden to my, I don't want to see boyfriend because I'm 50 years old and I think that's silly, but my partner, um, I want to be able to contribute financially. My ultimate goal is to go back to get my RN degree and being that we're already, we don't have smaller children, I wanted to be a traveling nurse and I know this sounds silly, but I wanted to buy a fifth wheel. He has a truck. I wanted to be a traveling nurse and, you know, visit the country and just enjoy. Together we have 19 grandkids and 10 oh, kids together. So I just want to enjoy our family, <laughs> our blended family now. now you're going to need a big RV. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to find it here. Do you have an outstanding debt to the, to the board? No, sir. Or no cost recovery? None. At this stage? What's that? Or was it? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Norton? So congratulations on your recovery and all the positive thank things you. that you have done. Um, and for also recognizing that you don't want to be a burden when you get to Texas. So do you plan on checking into AA there in Texas and to continue your support there? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, when I wrote to the <coughs> nursing board in Texas, I even expressed to them that if they needed to have me continue or finish this last year of probation or however long, I wouldn't have a problem still attending AA meetings, um, testing, whatever I needed to do just to prove both, to, not only just California, but to Texas as well. And the other thing is I still want to continue to have my t uh, California license. So when I visit my kids that do live here, I can still work per diem at my company, which they're willing to let me still stay on per diem. So you're going to maintain both lights? Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stone? Yes, thank you. Um, other than uh, uh, AA and your, your family, uh, do you have any other uh, support groups or um, have you... Uh, had any other counseling or therapy? Well, prior to that, I did my 18 months um, that was required when I got my DUI, my last one. Um, you know, I, I don't feel that I need to go to church to pray. Um, as a matter of fact, my partner is very, he's the person that I go to for if I need spiritual guidance. Um, you know, I have many friends, many, you know, a lot of family members that I go to for support. So, Basically, that's my support system. I don't. Uh, when you were drinking, uh, did you have particular stressors or triggers that caused you to uh, no. abuse or or, uh, or or use alcohol um, uh, uh, dangerously driving? No, oh, it, this is really dumb. Those two, my last two DUIs that I got were, I had two drinks both times, and I thought I had plenty of time to sober up. Back then, I was a lot thinner, so I weighed, probably weighed like 110 pounds, but two drinks really put me over the limit. Um, and I just thought, I'm just down the street. It's going to be okay. It wasn't that I was, it was just like, I think one of them was a birthday party or baby shower or something or something to that effect. But it wasn't because I was stressing out or anything. It was on my day off from work, you know, get together with a couple of girlfriends, had two drinks, and, and I drove. And that was my biggest mistake. I don't have anything further. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I'll ask the panel again if there's further questions. Dr. Mountain? Do you have a support system in Texas besides your significant other? I, well, other than his five kids, and I, I do have now, I think now we have like, I can't even say, maybe two or 300 mutual friends. Uh -huh. And whenever, you know, I do come out and visit, you know, we sit around and we talk and, you know, I can seek, I, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the area where he lives, but I can seek, you know, 
support there if I needed, you know, to go to a church or something. But like I said, I don't feel like I need to go to church to be connected spiritually because he is very well familiar with the Bible. And I am also very good friends with his mom and dad. And his mom has been incredibly um, very supportive of all of this. And so I feel like I have a pretty good family support system in Texas. But, but your parents, who you've mentioned a couple of times, they're still here in California. My parents are here, yes, in California. Yes. Okay, I have no further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Turner? No questions. Ms. Carpenter? No questions. Ms. Endozo? No questions. Dr. Baste Martinez? <laughs> I just want to recognize that also in your petition, you mentioned that you're going to become a potential kidney donor. Okay, so recently um, my partner's sister um, is on dialysis and was in need of a kidney transplant. So last December, I had went ahead and started the application to see if I can be a match because they said we were a perfect blood type. So I went ahead and filled out the information and everything that they needed, um, all my history. We went on the cruise and when we were on our cruise, they called me and said that because of insurance purposes, they couldn't continue the process. But I still plan to, when, when I move, to hopefully do something about that and, and, and see if I can, you know, see if I am a match for her and see what we can do, you know, regarding insurance or, or whatever. But that's one of the other reasons why I really want to move and be closer to her because she is on dialysis and, and she's been very sick lately. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amazola. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Durking. No, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sellers. No, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norton. No, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Stone. Thank you. Submitted. Okay, uh, Ms. Matthews. Is there any any last comments you'd like to make to the board? I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to be here today. I feel, like I said, very privileged to be in front of everybody, and I just. Just want to thank you humbly. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Matthews, do you have any other witnesses you're calling? Yes, I do. Okay, you can call that person at this time. Okay, John Lopez. I'm sorry, can you say his last name again? John Lopez. Thank you. Mr. Lopez, if you could please approach. And Mr. Lopez, can you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the evidence you will give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And can you please state and spell your first and last name for the yes. record? John Lopez, J-O-H-N-L-O-P-E-Z. Thank you. And Mr. Lopez, would you like to make a statement on behalf of Ms. Matthews? I will. Whenever you're ready. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for uh, giving uh, Andrea, which if, if with your permission, if I can refer to as Patty, because I know her as Patty, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for all of y'all for giving us the opportunity to uh, come before you guys. Um, and I'm honored to give a, a rare and a very unprepared uh, deposition because I was barely asked right before lunch to do this. And uh, uh, First of all, uh, John Lopez, I am a rigging engineer uh, by career. Um, I am a prof professional audio engineer as a hobby. And I'm a mediocre country music ballroom dancer and Tejano music da dancer on the weekends when I have time. And the reason why I mention that is that's how Patty and I met. Is uh, a little over a year and a half ago, she... Uh, hit me up through Facebook Messenger um, because she seen that, uh, as she mentioned, uh, two years ago, November the 8th, my wife and I were in an accident and she didn't make it, she passed. Um, and though alcohol was present that evening, it wasn't the cause of the accident. And uh, to cope with my loss, I would go out dancing every weekend just to keep my mind off of things. And uh, Patty and I became friends on Facebook, and she's seen this, and uh, she uh, messaged me through Messenger and asked me if I would come dancing with her. And uh, the first thing I did was look to see where she lived, and she lived in California, and I'm from Houston. And um, 
I said, well, sure, that would be a great opportunity to get out and go somewhere else and go dancing. When is this event? She said, this weekend. Uh, well, I don't have the money to buy that plane ticket to go. Um, so we eventually met, and uh, we've been talking and seeing each other for a little over a year and a half now. And um, I just want to build that character uh, deposition for her because, as she mentioned, uh, we have a lot of grandkids. And throughout the months that we, uh, we've been going back and forth, to tech her to Texas, me to California. She has met my entire family. My parents love her, my kids love her, and my grandkids love her. Though she's not taking the place of my wife, she is absolutely filling a void. And we all appreciate her and we want her in our lives completely. And, um, uh, my sobriety date is uh, November the 9th, 2017, after the accident. My brother also passed away of excessive alcoholism on July the 22nd of 2017, the same year. So I'm proud to say that as you meet somebody, a new partner in life, you try to tend to figure out what you have compatible with them. And sobriety is one thing that we eventually found out that we had compatible with each other uh, amongst a lot of other things. And I would just ask for your consideration um, for early, uh, early termination. That way I can move her to Texas and we can start a new life together. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, sir. I'm going to ask the panel members if they have any questions for you. Uh, Dr. Mountain. No questions at this time. Ms. Turner. No questions. Ms. Carpenter. No questions. Ms. Endozo. No questions. Dr. Baste Martinez. Congratulations and no questions. Thank you. Ms. Amazola. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, your character um, testimony. I, I think it was, it was great to hear from her partner where things are at. And I'm so glad that you shared with us that you are sober because that is a concern of ours that if you are going to go practice there that you will have the support system, social network to support your, you being sober too. So thank you for sharing that and being so candid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Durking. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. No questions. Thank you, Ms. Norton. I asked, um, thank you for being here. Um, I know that's, that's not easy, but I asked her if she was going to seek um, to go to AA when she got to Texas. And so since you freely shared your sobriety and your path, are, are you currently going to AA? No, ma'am. Okay. Are there any AA where you live? I'm pretty sure there is. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. No questions further. Thank you. Mr. Stone, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Lopez, thank you very much for your time this thank afternoon. You. you are excused. Uh, Ms. Matthews, any other witnesses you wish to call? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Then at this time, this petition hearing has concluded. The record is closed and the case is submitted. We can go off the record. Thank you. Thank you. And our last hearing for the day will be Tanya Still. John taking his students home. Two years in OA is not a. John, the man who snapped up at the end with the glasses on. I wouldn't give him. He was a board member. He used to sit there and I. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. Way. Okay, it looks like we're ready to proceed. Let's go on the record. Good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record before the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians to review the petition for early termination of probation by Tanya Still. This is OAH case number 2019-101015. My name is Tiffany King, and I am the administrative law judge with OAH who is assigned to preside over this matter. Prior to going on the record, all of the board members did identify themselves. I will note for the record that Ken Maxey is not present for this hearing, but we do have a quorum of the board present. If I could please have the appearance of counsel for the record, uh, beginning with you, Mr. Stone. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Your Honor, board members. Uh, my name is Jeff Stone, Deputy Attorney General. I'm appearing on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, and Business and Profession Code, Section 2878.7, representing the people of the state of California. Thank you, and Ms. Still, I will note for the record that you are present and representing yourself today, is that correct? Correct. And were you previously advised you could have hired an attorney to represent you? Yes. Okay, thanks. thank you. And Ms. Still, you and I met before uh, today's hearings and we discussed what was gonna happen in this proceeding, is that correct? We did, thank do you, you. Do you have any questions before we get started? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stone, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, again, first, I would like to mark for identification and offer into evidence as Exhibit 1, the petition packet with accompanying documents, which I have pro provided to uh, uh, the court uh, and which I believe the board members all have a copy of. Exhibit 1 consists of uh, the petitioner probation report dated October 2nd, 2019 at A001 through A003. Petition for early termination of probation dated October 15th, 2018, and supporting documentation at B001 through B025. Uh, the supporting document documentation includes uh, 12 letters of character reference that you can find at B009 through B021. Uh, these generally include um, uh, uh, letters uh, from uh, therapist, uh, pastor, uh, doctors, uh, colleagues, employers, uh, and longtime friends. <coughs> Following that, we have the certification of license history dated October 1st, 2019 at C001, and the notice of hearing and related correspondence at D001 through D004. Exhibit 1 also <coughs> includes the decision and order in BVNPT case number VN. 2013-1211, effective July 30th, 2016. That's E001 <coughs> through E0026. And at this time, I would like Exhibit 1 to be introduced into evidence. Ms. Still, do you have any <coughs> objection? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Uh, by way of uh, background, I would like to provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board Petitioner's vocational nurse license number is VN169402, first issued October 7th, 1994. An accusation was filed against petitioner July 2nd, 2015, alleging business uh, and profession code uh, violations for acts involving dishonesty, falsification of records pertaining to narcotics or dangerous drugs, self-administration, furnishing of a controlled substance or dangerous drug, and unprofessional conduct. The underlying facts regarding these causes for discipline were that petitioner obtained prescriptions for the narcotics Norco and Vicoprofen and furnished them back to the prescriber for his self-use. It was also alleged that petitioner forged her daughter's name to pick up her daughter's prescriptions and also herself used some of her daughter's prescription medication. The matter went to hearing on April 6, 2016 in the proposed decision, the administrative law judge found cause for discipline existed to revoke petitioner's license and ordered revocation stayed and a probation term of four years. Additionally, petitioner was ordered to pay investigation and prosecution costs in the amount of $3,195. The proposed decision was adopted by the board effective July 30th, 2016. Petitioner paid the cost recovery of $3,195 in full 
on February 27, 2019. Uh, petitioner was untimely on some of her required submissions, including uh, more particularly her submission of six of her quarterly reports and her submission of five of her work performance evaluation forms. Uh, these violations have been addressed and were determined not to warrant further disciplinary action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Still, do you have any additional documents you would like to submit to the board? No. Okay, thank you. If I could please have you raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the evidence you will give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Still. Whenever you're ready, you can begin. Okay. Um, first, I want to address the board and say how proud I am of my license and the hard work it took to receive this license. Um, as he mentioned, I've been a nurse since 1994, um, never had any issues, never had been in, had any problems. Um, but I'm here today because I shared pain medication with Brian Cable, MD. I hold myself accountable for what took place between myself and Dr. Cable. I am a law-abiding citizen whom before this had never been in any trouble and have not been in any trouble since. I have been a nurse, as I mentioned, for many years, working in several different areas of nursing, including but not limited to um, the operating room, outpatient, endoscopy, working mainly with RNs and doctors. I became a nurse because I love it. Um, my sister is a nurse. Uh, one of my sisters is a nurse practitioner. Um, my brother-in-law is a retired surgeon. <coughs> my sister's daughter is, an, is a doctor. So there's a lot of medical people around that make a difference, and I wanted to make a difference. I've completed all my assignments as expected. However, as he mentioned, I was late on some of them. Um, and I know the reasoning for that, but um, I'm not, I don't know if you want to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've, I've paid my fine. I continue um, to furnish the board quarterly and work performance forms, which I, I finally get receipt that they've received it, which was an issue before that. I attend church on a regular basis. I attend Al-Anon when I can. I continue counseling as I have since the event. Um, I volunteer for fundraisers for CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates. I succumb to manipulation of a respected doctor. Thank you. Dr. Mountain, do you have any questions? Good afternoon and welcome. To, it's, it's brave to be here. Um, I, I did wonder, you said you succumbed to the manipulations of a physician and that you attend Al-Anon. Do you, do you not attend uh, Narcotics Anonymous yourself? No, I was never ordered to. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was never ordered to. Um, I had valid prescriptions for my pain medications. Um, I had an accident in 2010, and I had um, um, medical issues that kept me um, able to receive pain medications for my pain. Um, so you were sharing those pain medications with the physician? Um, I believed him to be my best friend. We had become best friends, worked in the operating room together. I was a family friend. I helped him with the family. I was there through a divorce. Um, he was always great to me. And it started 
um, one day in his office, him saying something about having pain. And I laughingly said, because he had prescribed me medication, um, would you like one of my, one of my medication teasing him? Um, however, as time went on, he began to ask me for a couple. Um, it, and, and it progressed. As time went on, um, I realized that he had a problem. There were times when I um, wanted to not give him any medication because I felt that he needed to get treatment. There were times that he quit, and um, I, there, I had told him, um, I don't feel right doing this, and he said that he would get it anyway. So, um, but I did, I did share medication, yes. Is this person still in your life? No, not at all. Not at all for years, no. For years. Okay, no further question at this time. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Yes, Your Honor. Um, if we allow you to work as an LVN again, how do we know that we can trust you? When you will be exposed, thank you. Did you hear what I said at the first part? Yes. When you will be exposed to medication again, mm -hmm. not to excess it, to take it for your own use, or, or to use it inappropriately. Right. Um, good question. I myself have not had any medication <clears throat> for pain in approximately four years. Uh, when all of this became an issue, I just quit taking all of my medication, and that was it. I didn't look back. Um, and um, I have continued to work since my probation at a skilled facility, which is the hardest job I've ever had. But I do deal with narcotics, and um, I pass medications I would never have the conscience to use any of those medications. And I'm, I'm hoping, and so far I feel like I've been trusted, and I feel like I've been able to be trusted. So is your pain issue resolved? Um, it's better. It is better, but it is tolerable. For me, it is tolerable. And so how do you address it? Oh, I got you. The pain? What, yes, what you have left of it? Um, I, I do, and I think that um, was a time period mm -hmm. that I had to go through, um, neck and um, some, some lower back issues that um, I, I just don't think I require any medication for it. Um, I move about enough, I, um, I get, I, I walk, I get enough that I just haven't needed to use any. Okay, so there's two issues. One is the use of medication for possible pain, and the other is the addiction. And you believe that you're, you've... Oh, my addiction? Did you have an addiction? Were well, you addicted? Um, I took pain medication, I never took more in a day that was allowed for me to take. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Cable did not see me take my medication because um, I, I just didn't think it was needed mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like I was dependent on it during a time when I needed it. But as time went by, I, I got better. And being involved with that situation, I just stopped. I stopped taking it altogether. All right. And said I would, I'll live with the pain. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Carpenter. Yes, um, you state in your petition 
that you have therapy uh, twice a month. Yes. What has the therapy done for you? It completely changed my view on everything. It's helped me um, to try and forgive myself for my role. Um, it's helped me know what I did was wrong. Um, and it, it has helped me grow. It has helped me be a better person. I continue with counseling now, and um, I, I've just been able to get through a lot of the issues with the counseling that I've been receiving. Okay, thank you. Ms. Indozo. No questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Baste Martinez. Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Amazola. No questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Durking. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Yeah, um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm not, we're not here to, to rehear the original story particularly, but I do want to understand, I, I need to know how, how serious it was in order to determine whether or not the time that you have served is, or you have been on probation is adequate. Um, frankly, this is a terrifying scenario in my mind. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about your judgment. Um, you, you were witness to this, this physician, this surgeon, who was operating on people while you supplied him with, it looks like, a 10 or more a day, uh, but significant amounts of, of opiates. So I think this is very serious. Um, Again, not to retry it, but how do you justify well, why you are, you're a mandated reporter? You're there to care for exactly. patients. You're 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 a nurse. <clears throat> you were you were a part of a pretty pretty ter ter horrific um, situation. How, 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 do, how did you how do you justify it now? How do you how do you or not justify? Well, yeah. How do you square that circle? Um, I'm not sure I can justify such a mistake as this. Um, I know it was wrong. It was very wrong. Um, I've uh, I can't. I, I've seen him operate a lot, and I can't say that I've ever known or been aware of him operating on medication. Um, I, I certainly can't prove that, but from what I viewed, um, I had never seen evidence of him using medications while he was operating. Um, justification, it was wrong. It was very wrong of me. Um, um, it's been tough for me um, to forgive myself. Uh, and I'm not here to beat you up. This is not my, I'm just trying to, again, my, I guess another con concern, and I'm, I, I hope this is an appropriate question. It appears you had a very close relationship with this doctor. Did you have more than just a friendship with this doctor? No, not at all. Never. You, to my mind, a question about another line being crossed. No, injection, not at all. Like there that. was never, ever, there was never, ever a possibility. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Good, af good afternoon. So you got caught up, you were, ha you were on prescription pain medicines. Yes. Okay. How is it that this Dr. Cable came to be the one prescribing you the prescription medication? Um, he actually did several surgeries on my hand. Um, I had osteoarthritis and um, it ended up being several surgeries. So he was actually my doctor for several years and had performed, like I said, all the surgeries. So he wrote the prescriptions. Um, I also saw a neurologist due to my um, injury, and she also prescribed me, she prescribed me bicoprofen, which I only required um, a refill uh, maybe every two months. I, I didn't, every month, I didn't use it um, all the time. 
So the, you were able to maintain your pain? Yes. Okay. And you only required a prescription every couple of months? On the Vicoprofen from the neurologist, yes. Okay. Well, you were also getting it from Dr. Cable. Um, I had Vicoprofen from the neurologist, and Dr. Cable, like, he is, he, years before that, um, like in 1999, I had an issue, and he's the one that had originally prescribed Vicoprofen. Um, Vicoprofen was not his drug of choice. So um, then he started, as he was wanting me to give it to him, he was prescribing Norco. So you weren't on Norco. You were on Vicoprofen. Right. And then I he started, actually, let me finish first. He started prescribing you Norco and then started you asking, asking you for it. Did you ask for the Norco, or did he just start, you just went into his office one day and he's like, I'm switching your pain medicines from Vicoprofen to Norco? You know, I don't recall, but he might have said, do you want to try Norco? Mm -hmm. um, but I can't be for sure. I, I really don't remember okay. how that happened. How many years total did you take narcotics? Um, myself, my accident was in 2010, and um, I had to have an emergency surgery, and then I ended up with some neck issues. So, um, uh, a, a couple years at least. Okay. Daily? Um, no, no. Not daily? Okay. Um, I, all the. Not all the time, especially in the beginning. Okay. In the beginning. Okay. So you said that when Dr. Cable got in trouble mm -hmm. and he wasn't prescribing them for you anymore, were you still getting them from the neurologist? N no. I, I, I think I had stopped seeing her. I don't think I had seen her in a while, in 2013. Um, and I'm sure she re received a letter, but I, I don't think I was at, no, I wasn't asking her for prescriptions anymore. Okay, because you mentioned that when he got in trouble, you just quit taking them. I, I did, I did. You just all of a sudden didn't have a need for the narcotic pain medicine anymore? No, I, I, uh, it, it might not be that I didn't have a need at times. It was that I did not want to take any more pain medication um, after everything that was happening and happened. Can you explain that a little bit further? I decided to not take any pain medication any longer. Because you felt? I just felt it overall, it was not good for me. For you? Exactly. For how long, I mean, I could find it in the record, because I've read through this record, but approximately for how long did you supply Dr. Cable with narcotics? You know, I don't have an exact time. Six months, a year? At, at least a year. At least a year. A year and a half, probably. And yet your level of pain was such that you didn't need prescriptions but every couple of months to be refilled. But for a at in, least a year you received and shared your... I continued to take the pain medication for my neck, for my back, um, but after Dr. Cable, the whole arrest, mm -hmm. I decided whatever the pain was, I was not wanting to be associated with pain medication any longer. Okay. Um, so you don't take any 
narcotics right now? I, I haven't had any narcotics in probably four or five years. Okay. And Thank you. I'm sorry, last year I supplied the cures report and um, that was back to 2017 and they print out for a year. Um, but it's, uh, it's, been, it's been years since I've taken anything. I just, what I'm struggling with is um, in the healthcare industry, we are all very well aware of an opioid crisis. Um, reporting all of that, um, obligations, um, and yet you were, you were involved in it. I was, and I'm very sorry about that. It was, it, how do we know you're sorry? I guess that's my question because there was no, you were on probation, yes, and you haven't filled um, a prescription for narcotics according to the Cures Report, but how do we know you're actually sorry? I think it, it, you just have to listen to my comments and, and trust that, that I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, and what are you sorry for? My involvement with Brian Cable. Okay. Like, I don't mean to upset you. I'm just, you know, we, have, it's, we have to make this decision. So I mean, I'm sorry if I'm upsetting you. Okay. I have no further questions. Mr. Stone, do you have any questions? Uh, just a few. <clears throat> you, uh, you mentioned that you know... Uh, uh, Mr. Stone, if you could talk right, closer to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you um, know what you did was wrong. Um, <clears throat> did you know it was wrong at the time you were doing it? Um, at first, it was so minimal. But yes, yes. Okay. As, as, as it progressed, I knew it was wrong. Um, I tried to stop it. Um, he actually um, stole pills from my purse before. Um, and like I said, I... Um, yes. Uh, did you ever uh, talk to uh, Dr. Cable about um, any concerns that you had about him having a problem yes. or about taking your, well, your I was, medication? I was really worried about him because he was also getting prescriptions from elsewhere. It wasn't just my supply. He was um, writing prescription, I think, in his mother's name, in his girlfriend's name, large amounts, and then a friend of his who was unaware, he was writing, pres getting prescriptions in his name. I'm not sure if he got it from his, or wrote his father, but he was getting them in various places. And did you know he was doing that contemporaneously when, when that was going on, or was that something you found out after, after he got arrested? After. You mentioned that you don't uh, have a relationship with him anymore? No. H how did that relationship end? Um, I just realized um, he wasn't a good friend after all. Um, and that um, what I had done was wrong and I did not need to be associated with him anymore. And um, I, it, I just, we just stopped talking. So there wasn't any um, termination of the relationship uh, that was discussed? It was just that you both went your separate ways? Or was there a discussion that you had with him he, about the relationship? He moved. He moved from um, Redwood Valley, California, to San Jose to be around his children. So it made it easier not to see him. At first, when it first happened, he tried to maintain a friendship. Um, and then after that, he had 
several several attorneys, and um, he just I think he wanted to blame me, and so um, he also stopped calling me. <clears throat> but I had I, I I did contact him after I received the letter from the board, and. Um, was angry at everything that had happened. Uh, he was? No, or I was. You were. I was angry at the way he turned everything around. Uh, you blamed you for it? Yeah. The problems? He did, some of them. Uh, you'd mentioned in your petition um, that you are, uh, that you are undertaking ongoing efforts to be sure nothing like this happens again. Can you uh, describe for the board your efforts at uh, uh, and making sure that something like this doesn't happen again? Right. Um, uh, my family is a great support. Um, I, can, I continue the counseling. Um, I, I do the Al-Anon. <coughs> I rely on family and friends. Um, when I'm feeling down or I feel guilty, um, I, re I rely on family and friends, and I know myself enough now to know my boundaries and that it's okay to say no and not provide any medications to anybody except in my work capacity. Uh, in the uh, the packet we have in Exhibit 1 at B010, uh, uh, that's the letter uh, from uh, Christine Price. Uh -huh. uh, that's your uh, therapist? Right. And uh, that's a letter from October 29th, uh, 2018. And she mentions in that letter that that uh, she would see you at least monthly and, and frequently biweekly. Mm -hmm. um, since October 29th, 2018, is that about the same frequency that you see uh, uh, Ms. Price? Yes, I, at least two times a month. And that's ongoing? Yes. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask the board one more time if there's any more questions. Dr. Mountain? At any time, did you feel pressured by Dr. Cable? Yes. What was that?